Today, members of the House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from small business owners and their employees. A panel of economists discussed the economic and social effects of a minimum wage increase. The hearing runs three and a half hours. The Subcommittee on National Economic Growth, Natural Resources and Regulatory Relief is called to order. A uh, quorum being present, I have asked, previously asked uh, Mr. Peterson and told him that we would like to disperse with opening statements until we've heard the views of the working Americans and distinguished economists who have been invited to testify today. And of course, members may use portions of their questions to make any statements they may see appropriate. Uh, if our first witness, uh, Professor Newmark, would please rise and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Professor Newmark. And let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative. Now, our first witness today is one of the leading experts on economic and social effects of minimum wage increase. Uh, David Newmark is a professor of economics at Michigan State University. Uh, professor Newmark, I understand that you've previously testified before Congress that you're a lifelong Democrat and that you have never voted for a Republican. Uh, frankly, I think this issue should transcend party politics. Uh, what we've done today is invited Professor, also invited Professor David Card to testify about the New Jersey study that is often cited as a reason f that minimum wage increases will not cause losses in employment. Uh, Professor Card has declined to come. But I look forward to your testimony today, Professor Newmark, with regard to that study and also with regard to some of your path-breaking research on the effects of minimum wage on teenage unemployment and also uh, teenage dropout rates. So thank you very much for coming, and please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to have my written statement entered into the record. Uh, without objection, it will be done. I've been engaged with research on minimum wages in collaboration with William Washer of the Federal Reserve Board for the past six years. Our research covers numerous topics on the effects of minimum wages. I thank the committee for inviting me today to hear a brief overview of the findings of this research. I will divide my comments into three broad areas, each of which is pertinent to assessing the likely effects of the proposed minimum wage increase and to judging the research that is used by proponents of that increase. <clears throat> in our first paper on this topic, we used observations on the 50 states and Washington, D.C. over the period 1973 to 1989 to estimate minimum wage effects on the employment rate of young workers. We concluded from the evidence in this study and subsequent work that the elasticity of employment with respect to the minimum wage is in the range negative 0.1 to negative 0.2. To translate, these estimates imply that a 10 percent increase in the minimum wage reduces the employment rate of young workers by 1 to 2 percent. Given that the proposed increase is on the order of 20 percent, our results therefore predict an employment decline of 2 to 4 percent among young workers. As reported in my testimony to the Joint Economic Committee last year, these estimated effects imply that the proposed minimum wage increase would result in an employment reduction of 400,000 or more young workers. Because nominal wages have risen somewhat since those estimates were reported, I now prefer a more conservative estimate of an overall decline of 100 or perhaps closer to 200,000 jobs among young workers although predictions of a larger decline are also reasonable. I want to emphasize what these predictions do and do not mean. The fact that employment declines when the minimum wage goes up does not necessarily imply that raising the minimum wage is foolish policy. It does necessarily imply, however, that there is a trade-off. In contrast to the assertions of some economists and policymakers advocating a minimum wage increase who argue that minimum wage increases do not decrease employment. The real question, in my opinion, is whether the minimum wage is the best tool to attempt to reduce poverty. In my opinion, minimum wages are a relatively ineffective tool. First, as a result of minimum wage increases, some low-wage workers lose their jobs. Second, the minimum wage does not effectively target individuals in poor families, as the daughter of an affluent lawyer is covered by the same law as a single mother raising children. My personal preference is to increase the generosity of the earned income tax credit, which does not tax labor and hence does not reduce employment, and which targets poor families specifically. Our subsequent research went beyond the analysis of simple employment effects. The evidence in this research indicates that minimum wage effects on teenagers are more complex than simply a reduction in the number of employed teenagers. In particular, as economic theory would suggest, 
Minimum wage increases lead employers to substitute away from the lowest skilled labor, whose price increases when the minimum wage goes up, and to substitute towards more skilled labor. In the labor market for teenagers, this results in two things. First, those teenagers who have already left school, perhaps having dropped out, and are working full time, lose their jobs at a high rate, becoming what we call idle, that is, neither in school nor employed. Second, teenagers who were previously enrolled in school, perhaps working part time, and who are presumably more skilled, now face more attractive labor market opportunities and are led to leave school and take up full time work. Table 2 provides details. In the first row, the first column indicates an increase of 11 percent in the proportion of teenagers who go from in school and employed to not in school and employed as a result of a 21 percent increase in the minimum wage, which is the proposed increase. These are the more skilled teenagers who leave school to take up full time work. The second column indicates an increase of 17 percent in the proportion going from not in school and employed to idle. These are the lowest skilled teenagers who are displaced from their jobs as a result of minimum wage increases. Our most recent research reconsiders the evidence presented by David Card and Alan Kruger in what is certainly the study most frequently cited by proponents of increasing the minimum wage. They studied fast food restaurants in New Jersey and Pennsylvania before and after the minimum wage in New Jersey rose from 425 to 505 and found that, in contrast to most economists' expectations, relative employment rose in New Jersey rather than falling. However, their data were obtained from a telephone survey that elicited very imprecise measures of employment changes over the period of their study. We have obtained and collected actual payroll data from many of the same restaurants included in their sample and find strikingly different results. Using the payroll data, leads to very much the opposite conclusion from Card and Kruger. The first two rows of Table 3 report estimates using the telephone survey data. As the second column indicates, these data imply that minimum wage increases lead to large increases in employment. Obviously, if this conclusion is correct, then much of the argument against minimum wage increases falls by the wayside. But the last row shows that using the payroll data, the estimated employment effect is negative, with the magnitude of the effect similar to that in other studies of low-skilled workers. Not surprisingly, our reexamination of the study has attracted rather vociferous criticism. I do not have time in my statement to delve into the details of this criticism, but I will be happy to do so during your questioning. I will state at this point, however, that in my opinion, this criticism has done nothing to undermine our findings, that the results of the original New Jersey-Pennsylvania study are driven by highly imprecise data, and that our payroll data indicate that New Jersey's minimum wage increase led to an employment decline in fast food restaurants in that state. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Newmark, and I appreciate you coming in this early morning at the beginning of the hearing uh, and understand that you have a plane to catch later in the day. Let me ask you a couple questions um, about the data that you presented. One of the things that you mentioned was you Earlier, it predicted the job loss of as much as 400,000. Now, with the increase in, in the marketplace of wages, it could be 100 to 200,000 young people. Uh, what, have you seen any data that, that indicates the parallel effects among seniors or other members of the population? Uh, could, is there a factor that we could multiply those numbers by to get a, a rough estimate of the total job loss in society? Or is that type of data not available? We certainly have data on the number of workers outside of this group of younger workers who, who earn at or near the minimum wage. There haven't been studies which, addressed the, which have addressed their employment effects in large part because there tend to be relatively few of them. It, so it's guesswork as to what the employment effects would be. But roughly, sl slightly over half of minimum wage workers are in this group we study. If you felt comfortable extrapolating the effect we estimate for young workers, then you would roughly double the effects. But I would not uh, want, to, want to push that position without more formal research on the question. Okay. But, but as a, a rough estimate in, in terms of thinking about it in the magnitude uh, that, that we could increase it by 50 to 100 percent and, and have an idea in our minds of how many jobs may be at stake in, in this debate? I don't think, it, it, I don't think it, 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 it's out of line to assume that employment effects among those workers would be similar. And. And I think that's important because the real question that comes before us as we debate whether to increase the minimum wage 
is not whether we want to increase the economic benefits to people who are at the lower and lowest end of our economic scale, but what are we doing for those individuals and what are the negative effects of that type of regulation? And the most obvious negative effect, I think, is that many entry-level positions will, will be eliminated and cause significant problems for people who are just starting out in their careers, teenagers, or searching for a job in order to go off of public assistance and be, enter into the workforce. So I think that's very, very important for us to focus on. Another point that came to mind as you were presenting your statistics about uh, teenagers, you mentioned that there was an 11 percent increase in all teenagers who were in school switching to not in school and full-time employed, and that and those are the relatively skilled teenagers, and that there was a 17 percent increase in those already out of school, the people who've dropped out of public school going from the category of employed to not employed. The interesting thing was you also broke it down in your chart and indicated that the, the strongest benefit of skilled workers go to non-blacks and non-Hispanics. Uh, I take it generally predominantly white uh, teenagers went up 11 percent and that the strongest negative effect for people who have dropped out of school and go from being employed to unemployed was among blacks and Hispanics and that there was a 25 percent increase in unemployment in that category. And so it strikes me the, the combined effect there is to have a shift away from blacks and Hispanics to uh, non-blacks and non-Hispanics in terms of the type of jobs that will be available and, and the demand for their skills in the marketplace. Uh, am I reading your statistics correct in that? Yes. L let, me, let me correct one point which, which comes up frequently uh, in the media and elsewhere. We typically don't talk about the minimum wage increasing unemployment because unemployment also has something to do with whether you're looking for work. We talk about employment and non-employment just to be on safe, on firmer ground. Yeah, the, the, the point of, of this research on teenagers and these shifts in and out of school is, again, that, that, that a minimum wage increase does exactly what you would expect, it seems, in the data, and that is to encourage employers to substitute away from the least skilled workers, because their price has really gone up, and towards other workers. In the market, whether it's because of employer perceptions of lower productivity minorities or true lower productivity, uh, for whatever reason, it, it's, it, it appears as employers shifting away from minorities and towards uh, white teenagers. The other thing you see in that table, which reflects in some sense the same thing, is that the increase in the proportion going from, in school, from, sorry, em from employed to idle, as we call it, is concentrated nearly exclusively among those who are initially earning below the new minimum wage, the lowest wage workers, again, as you'd expect. And those teenagers who are drawn from school, and they're typically in school combined with part-time work, tend to be higher wage workers. So they are workers whose wage is not bid up there's not increase, I should say, because of the minimum wage. So it's reflecting the same, the same type of behavior. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. So I think very clear that, that some of the least advantageous groups in our society are the most harmed by this effort, which is well intended in its outset. Um, my time period for the initial questioning has lapsed, but I have a few more questions, so we'll, we'll have a second round. Let me turn now to the ranking member of our subcommittee, uh, my colleague from Minnesota, Representative Peterson. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've got another hearing going on, so I may have to shuttle back and forth. Uh, so if I'm not here, I apologize. But it seems like every um, time we have a hearing, they schedule one on my other committee at the same time. Um, After uh, reading some of this stuff, it's uh, hard to know uh, who to believe. But I just came from a meeting this morning of uh, some people in the um, meat processing industry. We were working on meat inspection in another one of my subcommittees. And they were telling me uh, that uh, Minneapolis, which is not in my district, uh, that the fast food restaurants are advertising in Minneapolis seven dollars an hour. Uh, is that? I live, in a, I, live, I live in a lower priced town and the fast food restaurants are advertising five fifty to six dollars. There are certainly 
employers of relatively low wage labor who are playing, paying more than the minimum. Fast food restaurants are not the lowest wage employer in the labor market. They're, they're an obvious visible low wage employer, but not the but lowest wage employer. But is that what your study, you, you studied the fast food restaurants? Is that what I understood? We re-examined the, the, the New Jersey, <laughs> Pennsylvania study, which was a study of fast food restaurants. In, that, in those labor markets in that period, uh, it, it does appear that there, there were many workers for whom at least the starting wage was below the minimum, and those wages were increased when the minimum wage went up. Clearly, that's an important thing, an important question to ask. If we raise the minimum in a range where no one is earning it, then, then, it, then it will have no effect. In a market like Minneapolis, at least in the fast food industry, if, if in fact they're paying $7 to start, we wouldn't expect any effect. That's certainly true. But in lower wage areas of the country, in lower yeah. wage industries, we might. Okay. Well, uh, well, I guess I was kind of wondering a couple things. One is, but this study really just focused on the fast food restaurants. The Card Kruger study was a study of the fast food restaurants. And, and in that area, the fast food restaurants start people off at the minimum wage. Is that they had? In, they, in the, well, they initially did their survey before the minimum wage in New Jersey went up, and there were many workers in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey who were at the minimum. And then when the minimum went up in New Jersey, the wage distribution did, in fact, appear to shift. So the minimum wage really did something to the wage distribution in that case. And what period of time was this? This was the survey was done in 1992. The, the minimum wage went up, I believe, in April of 92. Okay, so it was right after that change took place. And it went from what to what? From the minimum wage in New Jersey went from four and a quarter to 505 in Pennsylvania. Stayed at four and a quarter. Um, yeah, my... Uh, I don't know. In my district, I'm more concerned about um, oh some of this uh, small mom and pop type restaurants and resort type businesses. I think they're the ones that are going to be more vulnerable to this kind of a situation than um, maybe the fast food franchise type deals. Did anybody look at those kinds of businesses? There haven't been many studies that looked at a specific industry. Most studies that I've done, that, that the other witnesses have done, uh, and that many other researchers have done, typically focus on all young workers in the country or in a particular state. And the reason is because studying a particular industry is not something which really provides a very good test. Uh, the example you give is a good one. If I have a McDonald's and a, a sort of mom and pop diner on opposite, on opposite corners and the minimum wage goes up, it's, it's, it's likely that the diner is going to be much more affected by that than the McDonald's. They may have more, more low wage labor than the McDonald's. They may have less capital used to produce their food, used to produce the, the, the services in the restaurant, and they might be more affected. You might, in fact, find that the, the diner has to raise its prices a lot or, in the worst case scenario, shuts down, and demand at the McDonald's goes up. That's even possible. And that's why I, 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 I often emphasize that whatever your conclusion on who's right about this New Jersey, Pennsylvania minimum wage study, it simply shouldn't be taken as decisive evidence in this debate. A study of a, narrow, a very narrowly defined industry is not a very compelling study because in some, anything can happen to one industry even if employment declines across the board. Uh, did I hear you say you think a better solution is to raise the earned income tax credit? Yes. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that program uh, and uh, I, you know there's been some discussion here during the budget debate where they were talking about changing the earned income tax credit. Uh, have you followed that at all? Not as closely as the minimum wage research. but. Um, what, do you, what do you think should be done? Do you have a specific proposal what should be done with the earned income tax credit? No, there, there, there are certainly other... And how other, do you pay for it? It's a budget item. and I, I understand that politically a minimum wage is, is obviously easier to, easier to sell than, a, than an earned income tax credit in, a, in an era of budget cutting. That's certainly true. Uh, an earned income tax credit has some cost. It does reduce labor supply of some workers. But the evidence seems to suggest that those, those effects are minimal. It encourages participation of, of those who otherwise wouldn't be working. Uh, it, it, it does show up as an expense in the budget. That's unavoidable. Uh, can I just finish up with one? I think Certainly. my time. Uh, has, has, anybody, has any study ever been done on the earned income tax credit? Uh, the only, the, what I know about this is when I did tax returns and I actually saw what happened to people that, first of all, most people didn't know about it and well, would be shocked to find out that they were going to get all this money at the end of the year. They thought it was kind of crazy. Well, the IRS you know. is required, though, to, to, to check returns and pay the earned income tax credit, even if, an even if a, a filer does not check well, it. Well, I understand. You have to file. I, which yeah, I understand. But I mean, right. uh, well, my question is, uh, my ex when people did find out about it, you know, they've got this kind of cliff effect in there. And there's a range. If you hit your employment in that range, then you'll get the maximum amount. What happened in uh, a lot of the cases, 
was, would uh, people would stop working when they hit that amount because uh, they'd get more money, you know, uh, if they kept kept their income. And then you had self-employed people, farmers and so forth, that would try to target their income so that they would get the maximum amount out of the earned income. I mean, uh, first of all, people didn't know about it when they found out about it. They started to game the system. So I, the, I'm the, not, you know, I'm not sure that's the solution to this. Economists Problem certainly either, expect that people would, to some extent, perhaps reduce their hours of work when, at the, when, when the maximum credit starts to fall off. It's not they would make more money that way, but the, the incremental wage they would get gets pretty low because it starts to get taxed at a high rate. It's like any, any government program. There are, there are people who will game it. You'll always be able to find egregious cases of fraud. The one advantage of it is it's done through the tax system. We have an organization, the IRS, set up, which, which presumably is pretty good at figuring out who's declaring their income correctly and who isn't, not to say there aren't mistakes made. Uh, and it's certainly not the case that all the mistakes are among the low-income population. Uh, it's not a perfect program. That, that's certainly the case. Uh, the, the, reason I, the reason I prefer it in this particular context is because it, it, it is targeted, it is based on family income. It targets poor, it, workers in poor families. The minimum wage, we know, is a, is, is a very, as Cardin Kruger, in fact, called it, a very blunt instrument. Many minimum wage workers are non-poor families. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for joining us. Uh, let me turn now to the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Klinger from Pennsylvania. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just uh, want to, first of all, commend you on holding this hearing. Uh, I think this hearing, which is, I think, a balanced hearing, is going to contribute a great deal to the debate on this uh, highly emotionally charged issue and hopefully also clear away some of the fog that has uh, enveloped it over the political rhetoric uh, that we've heard in recent months about it. So I really am delighted that we're having this hearing today. And I think uh, uh, with the distinguished uh, panels that we're going to hear from, I think it will do a great deal to at least clarify uh, the pluses and minuses, the pros and cons, if you will, of, of the minimum wage. I was interested, Dr. Newmark, and I mean, and we all, I think we, we start from the premise that all of us are interested in doing what is going to be really helpful to the least fortunate in our society to ensure that they are not operating at that, uh, you know, below uh, the uh, standard of living, a, a reasonable standard of living. And that, of course, is the bottom line of this debate. How do we do that? You have suggested the minimum wage is not the most efficacious way to do that, that perhaps the earned income tax is, is the way to do it. What I think I was really struck by is, uh, given the same uh, study, how we could come up with such uh, divergent uh, interpretations of that study, and you indicated that that your review of that has been subject to a great deal of criticism. Would you care to uh, uh, expound on that a little bit of how that uh, divergence, how you would uh, reconcile that divergence? Sure. The the Cardin Kruger data were collected from a telephone survey. Uh, a surveyor called up each restaurant and asked, effectively, I don't know the quote in front of me, how many employees do you have in this restaurant? Uh, the problem with that question, I think, in retrospect, and I don't think they would really disagree, is it's very imprecise. That could be anywhere from a head count of the number of people on the current shift to the number of people on the monthly payroll, which in a, a restaurant with a lot of part-time workers could be 40 or 50 people. Uh, then they come back eight months later and ask the same question, not necessarily of the same person, no effort to get the same person on the phone, so at least however they chose to answer the question uh, might be consistent. What you see as a result is, 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 is rather wild changes in employment in these restaurants. You find many restaurants where the number of employees went up by 20 or 30 or went down by 20 or 30. Most of us have been to fast food restaurants. That, that doesn't seem to, to accord with what really happens in these restaurants. Uh, the variance in employment over time seems pretty small. We collected uh, initially in consultation with, with a group which clearly has a stake in the debate, the, the Employment Policy Institute. Uh, data from fast food re from the same fast food restaurants, or at least the restaurants in the same zip code areas from which Cardin Kruger got their data, and we asked them to supply their actual payroll records. We subsequently took off on our own and collected a lot more uh, such data. We so we ended up with, with, in some sense, the same study. We didn't try to do anything different from what Cardin Kruger did, but the data set was completely different. Our data were based on the payroll records that employers keep for UI purposes, IR purposes, and the like, and I think are therefore much more accurate. Um, so it, what seems to be the case is that, is that there's just excessive noise in their data. Uh, the variance of employment changes in our data is one-third what it is in their data. And the noise seems to be so great that you actually get misleading results uh, from the data. Mm -hmm. So it's not two interpretations of the same set of right, results. Right, I understand. Uh, 
do you have any uh, suggestions other than uh, as, as the, I mean, you indicate that the minimum wage is really an imprecise sort of a ham-handed way to go about dealing with that lower income level because, in fact, the minimum wage uh, is indiscriminate in terms of who it's going to be applied to. It's not, it doesn't go just to the, uh, to the less fortunate. It goes to middle class uh, uh, teenagers as well. Is that not true? I mean, in other words, yes. it, it is not an all selective or focused on no, those. No, it's not at all selective. And, if, and if, you, if you made it selective by only letting, you know, by having right. a lower, a, a, a higher minimum for, of course, the, the, the most disadvantaged workers, that would be even worse because then really nobody would hire them. Right. Whereas the earned income tax credit is, in fact, a, a much more focused, a more uh, laser-like, if you will, uh, way to approach this problem. Yeah, it is. And there are, there are, other, there are other things we could do, perhaps That's more complex. I would... That's what I was going to get to next. Look, you... What we'd ultimately like is, is for workers to be sufficiently high skilled to earn, to earn a high wage in a market without a minimum wage that, that gives them a decent standard of living. That's a question of schools and training and all sorts right. of questions. I'm not an expert on those. There are other people who are much more noted as experts on uh, what, what the possible remedies are. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing again. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman Klinger, for joining us today. Let me turn now to my colleague from Minnesota, uh, Mr. Gil Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you also for holding this hearing. Uh, I am neither an economist nor a, a student of history, but, uh, but I'm interested in both. And, uh, and I think this, this hearing and this testimony is particularly important. Let me first of all establish, uh, Professor Newmark, I believe I'm correct in this. You are not a Republican shill, are you? Not at all, no. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your politics? I, I don't. What, what details are going to have? I've, I've always been a Democrat. I'm, I'm, I, I, I said in my statement that, uh, in, in my opinion, the question is what's the best way to reduce poverty. I, I take that as an important, uh, an important goal, and I have no objection to government meddling in that process as long as they do it effectively. No, that's no, why, I, I admire that. I, I just wanted to make sure that I was correct in that. that uh, and, and I think the whole idea, and, and help me, I may be wrong in this, but I think that the first government that tried to artificially set wages and prices uh, was a Middle Eastern king by the name of Habib Rabi. Am I right on that? I'm not enough of a You're student, not a student of history. I know the answer to that question either. Okay. Um, I, I'm particularly interested, though, in, in uh, some studies. In, are you familiar with studies done by a, a gentleman by the name of um, Masarami Hashimoto and Liad Phillips? Are you familiar with either of those? The first, the yes. The second, no. Can you tell us a little bit about those studies? Uh, if, 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 if I'm thinking of the one you're, you're speaking of, ha uh, Hashimoto did a study uh, which is a, an interesting question and one that, that is perfectly consistent with economic theory. The, the, the notion is that, that uh, workers get training in schools and elsewhere, but they also get training in the workplace. Uh, and what we think happens, and there's a lot of evidence that in fact this does, is that employers will initially pay a low wage to workers while those workers are acquiring skills and, those wages, and their wages will rise over time uh, as the skills are acquired. Uh, Hashimoto's prediction based on the theory uh, was that a minimum wage increase will, in some sense, deter training. If, 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 if when I'm training a worker, that worker really isn't worth much to me because they're really not producing much, they're spending most of their time training, I may only hire them if I can pay them a very low wage. If, if the minimum wage imposes a floor below which I can't go, I may choose not to train that worker. It may no longer be worthwhile to me to train that worker. The evidence in the paper, and I think this is evidence that really ought to be reassessed in light of, of more recent data, suggests that to some extent that happens. You find it, it's not direct evidence, but there, there's evidence consistent with less training of workers when the minimum wage goes up. You, you've also come to the conclusion with your studies that, uh, that an increase in the minimum wage increases the number of high school dropouts. Ha, have you been able to quantify? I mean, that, that, there's an enormous social cost to kids dropping out of high school. In fact, I also serve on the Washington, D.C. Oversight Subcommittee, and one of the biggest problems we have in the city is, is high school dropouts, kids not staying in school, not getting the, the, the education, and ultimately becoming much less employable. Can you talk a little bit about the, the impact or the, have you done any studies that uh, quantify the, the costs of kids dropping out of school? Uh, the, the answer to the last question is no. First of all, it's, it's, it's not, we, we are probably seeing some dropping out behavior. I showed you the slide which said the proportion that you get the shift of teenagers from not in school and employed to not in school, not employed. Some of those we think are dropping out. That's always hard to tell because we, all, all we really know is that 16 to 19 year olds in a state where the minimum wage goes up are more likely to be in that state. It may be that they chose not to continue beyond the 12th grade perhaps, but I suspect some of it is dropping out. It, it, it's a big percentage increase. The number, I think, on the slide that was up there was a 17% increase. 
It's a small, that's a big percentage increase over a small base. So that's an increase by, 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 by about two percentage points in the proportion of teens in that about category. The total population of teens. Total population of teenagers. So it's, it's not a massive increase in the number of people, though it's a big percentage increase. I think your question is a very good one. It, is that, in fact, related to other social ills? It's not something I've studied. It's something I'd like to study. Uh, and it's not something other people have picked up on yet, although I've been asked the question before. One of the other conclusions that uh, I'm not sure you've drawn or, or other economists have drawn, that if, if more kids drop out of school, you have a bigger problem with crime. It seems plausible, certainly. I, I haven't seen evidence on the question yet, but it, it, it certainly seems reasonable. Well, listen, I want to thank you for coming today and, uh, and thank the uh, chairman for holding this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gutnick. Let me turn now to our colleague from Arizona, also a freshman, Mr. John Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Newmark, first of all, let me thank you very much for taking the time to come here and for giving us your uh, learned advice. I appreciate it. And it looks to me like you have studied this subject for quite a while. and. Uh, I appreciate that you are bringing us your objective views. I listened to your testimony about the Card Kruger study, which I found to be very persuasive with regard to the mistakes that may have been made in the gathering of that data and then the data that you've gathered, uh, which suggested it is wrong. But let me ask you a different question. Even if, in fact, you had not gone back and redone, so to speak, the Card Kruger study, that study would have, in fact, reached an aberrational conclusion compared to virtually every other study of this issue in the field of economics, would it not? Virtually every other study, if you look over the whole historical record, but there, there clearly have been a number of studies, I, I think David Card's name is on most of them, uh, in the last three or four years, which have found no effects of minimum wage increases. The New Jersey, Pennsylvania study was unique in suggesting that minimum wage actually increased employment. Uh, there are, but there are other studies out there suggesting no effect. I think there's good reason to expect that to happen. If you take a labor market where, as we were discussing before, market wages are quite high, raising the minimum will have virtually no effect or no detectable effect. Uh, our, our other witnesses, I imagine, will discuss some of their research suggesting that it's going to be very hard in many labor markets to detect an effect of a minimum wage increase because of, of properties of the data, essentially. Uh, but it's certainly true that, that most of the studies in the past and the preponderance of recent studies have found negative minimum wage effects. Did I understand you to say that the preponderance, almost all of the studies that reach an opposite conclusion involves Mr. Card? Is that what you just said? I can't put my, I, I would say that the, the majority of them, I don't know what the, I don't know the exact count, I haven't counted the recent ones, but I think that's accurate. Fair enough. Um, I, your, your bottom line is what could this Congress do to deal with the issue of poverty uh, and how can we best help those in need in this country? I take it that's the approach you come at this issue from? Yes. And it is clear to you the minimum wage is not the answer to that? Yes. Um, have you done other studies in, in the welfare arena in terms of were we to raise the minimum wage and if it had what most economists anticipate is a negative effect on employment, both of young people and perhaps of others, uh, have you done studies to indicate or are you aware of studies that indicate what would happen with regard to the burden imposed on the otherwise existing welfare system? Uh, I have not studied the question. The, the only study I'm aware of that goes at that question directly is, I think, slightly different from what you're asking, but related. Excuse me. This is a study by Peter Brandon, which is, again, it's not, it's not published yet, nor is, nor is my Pennsylvania New Jersey study, so these things are still subject to, to peer review and changes. Uh, but that study claims that when you raise the minimum wage, it takes individuals, typically women, longer to get off of welfare, which is a perfectly reasonable expectation. These are people who are very low skilled. Uh, we, we, we think entry-level jobs disappear when the minimum wage goes up, and therefore it ought to be harder for them to find jobs. But again, that, that's one study. It's not a question that's been studied extensively. I suspect it will be over the next few years because it's been very much the focus of debate lately. Well, certainly if we go ahead and enact a minimum wage and it knocks people off of, uh, it knocks people off of the employment rolls and into the welfare system, there'll be a database to study. <laughs> um, are you aware of any other impacts that you can anticipate on the welfare system, on uh, the earned, earned income tax system, on others that you could anticipate from an increase in the minimum wage? Well, it's hard to say. To some, I mean, it, this, this recalls the question that was asked earlier with respect to what happens to other workers. To the extent we're focusing on teenagers, there probably aren't big effects. A lot of those teenagers don't, aren't going to get unemployment benefits, aren't going to enter the welfare system, et cetera. Once we start getting to older workers and, of course, women with children, those become more real possibilities. Um, I, I think, you know, again, the, as I've emphasized, the minimum wage is a trade-off. Some workers make more, some workers lose their jobs. 
It's probably a small number who lose their jobs, but nonetheless, for them, it's a pretty serious, it's a pretty serious event. Some smaller fraction of them will enter, will perhaps draw welfare benefits or unemployment insurance or some other, some other form of compensation. I tend not to lean on that as my principal argument against the minimum wage, partly because I, I suspect it's not that big effect, but more importantly because I just don't know how big the effect is. Um, what about the issue of the impact on those teenagers who do lose their jobs with regard to, for example, crime? Uh, are you aware of studies in that arena? With regard Again, to that, that was asked earlier. There, there, there were some earlier studies, I believe, from the 70s or perhaps the early 80s, which attempted to, to study the relationship between crime and Youth, employ youth labor markets and minimum wages. I think, I think there's some evidence, again, there, there's people who are far more expert in this than I am, because studying crime statistics is a very, a very complicated endeavor in and of itself. I think there are some people out there who will claim that a, a worse youth labor market is likely to lead to more crime. It certainly follows uh, from, from theory. Uh, but I wouldn't claim to be an expert on that evidence. And, and no doubt you explained this earlier, but I'm having some difficulty with it, and would appreciate it if I could hear it again. Precisely how is it that or what is it that you would recommend this Congress do with regard to the earned income tax credit to, in fact, do what it could for those who are uh, in need of help in this economy more than any others? Well, we, one can increase the generosity in a number of ways. One has the, one has the, 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 the marginal rate at which you, you increase earnings initially. One has the maximum benefit and, one has, well, and the period for which you get the, up the earnings max at which you can get it, as well as the phase-out rate. There, there's research by, by Saul Hoffman and others which tries to calculate the relative cost of those various ways of doing it. My reading of it is it doesn't, it doesn't matter a heck of a lot. Obviously, the more generous you make it, the more it will cost. Um, but it seems to me, given the benefits available, given the, given the potential policies out there, uh, that this is one we can point to that really puts income, more income in the hands of poor families. Now, and, and, the, and, and significantly better than an increase in the minimum wage. I think so. And one thing to keep in mind is that the earned income tax credit currently is very small. The maximum, maximum level of earnings is quite low. And we really don't have a good, good experience at asking what will happen if we make it a lot more generous. So I, I think one should always be cautious in saying we should, we should double or triple the amount of income one can get off of this. Um, but it seems like, like incremental changes are, are unlikely to be very costly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shattuck. And now, uh, for a round of questioning, our colleague from Florida, Mr. Scarborough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the hearing. Appreciate you being here today, uh, whether you're a Republican shill or not. I um, <laughs> wanted to ask you very, very quickly. Oh, well, first of all, I wanted to make a comment uh, um, regarding uh, Mr. Card. <clears throat> uh, from my understanding, Mr. Chairman, I got in late. He was invited today, correct? That is correct, to join us on this first panel. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, and from my understanding, he has not, despite all of his studies, he's not made any recommendations uh, about actually raising the minimum wage, despite the fact that, that uh, Democrats are using his, uh, his work to suggest that. Have, have you ever uh, heard uh, Mr. Card make, make such suggestions, such conclusions? No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, I, I think one, one, one could read their book and find certainly strong statements that minimum wages don't reduce employment. Right. Um, but he has not come out as to my knowledge, and made strong policy recommendations. Okay. Let me ask you a real quick question. You, I, I think I heard you say that you had concluded that, that possibly raising the minimum wage might not cause a, a great loss of jobs. You're just not really sure. Is that, is that correct? I th yeah, it's important to keep in mind what, 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 what exactly is going on here. Let's, let's suppose we take my number of 200,000 jobs right. lost among young workers. Now, people will say, well, okay, so, so the minimum wage is going to go up 20 percent. Uh, that, that number comes from a 1% reduction in employment of young workers. That sounds like a phenomenal trade-off. 20% right. higher wages, 1% of a subgroup of workers lose their jobs. You have to keep in mind, though, that that, 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 is, that overstates the trade-off tremendously for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, only a subset of workers will see their wages go up as a result of the minimum wage increase, and you want to use them as the base right. with which to compare the number of job losers. Mm -hmm. Second of all, Many of the minimum wage workers, whose, many workers whose wages would rise as a result of the minimum wage increase, are not going to get the full 20 percent. Many of them earn far closer to 515 right. than four and a quarter at the moment. Um, so the trade-off there is not nearly, I, I think, not nearly as good as it's often made out to be when people talk about the 20 percent increase versus a one to two percent loss. Um, and finally, as, as my work on teenagers suggests, there, there's other trade-offs going on. The, 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 the net employment effect for teenagers, in particular is quite small, but as I showed and, and as we've discussed in greater detail, 
that hides some, perhaps, some relatively important shifts, the lowest skilled ones being displaced from jobs and higher skilled teenagers moving into those jobs. Okay. Now, you're, the study that you, uh, you are talking about and, and uh, your conclusions have to do with a 20 percent increase. I, I'm sure you're aware of the, the 1981 study, uh, the congressional study that the Wall Street Journal cited a couple of weeks ago that actually talked about studying a 10 percent increase and talked about the possibility of a 1 to 3 percent loss in teenage employment. And if you move that to 1996 numbers, that would be between about 150 and 400,000 jobs. Is that, is that uh, consistent with your past studies? Or, uh, do you, or, or would you take exception with the possibility of possibly a 1 to 3 percent increase in loss of jobs? The, the, the research from the early 80s on which that was based was reviewed, I think, relatively well by, by, by Charlie Brown and, and two other economists. Uh, the range of estimates was exactly that, that a 10 percent increase in the minimum reduces employment 1 to 3 percent. They lean towards the lower end of the range, and I think studies subsequent to that, including my own, have suggested that the lower end of the range is probably a more appropriate okay. estimate. Okay. Uh, I have another question uh, regarding uh, free trade, uh, obviously with NAFTA, GATT, and, and the, the impact on the minimum wage. No, actually, I'm going to ask you to tell me everything about NAFTA in five minutes or less. I won't, no, um, I won't need five no, minutes. No, actually, I, I, and I, only reason I ask this is because I was at a town hall meeting and somebody brought, brought this up, brought this, uh, this point up, that actually, as we move into a, an era of free trade, especially with NAFTA, where uh, we're seeing a good number of, of low-paying American jobs going across the border uh, to Mexico, because obviously that's the idea, to, to let Mexico build up with, with low-wage jobs and let America eventually create a positive trading uh, partner with Mexico. Doesn't it, doesn't it seem to make base, fairly good sense that if we raise the minimum wage even more, uh, we, we have a, a good chance of losing even more jobs to Mexico and other third world countries in, in uh, our attempt to open up uh, trade among, between ourselves and third world countries? Well, uh, the, uh, we, we have evidence, I think, that, that, that jobs are reduced or job growth is, it falls at any rate uh, when the minimum wage goes up. I haven't seen evidence directly linking it to, to whether those jobs appear elsewhere. I think one thing to keep in mind is that it's the service sector that is the lowest wage sector in the economy, and those jobs in some sense can't go across borders. That's not to say that there are not some jobs that can, some crude data entry jobs, some very simple manufacturing jobs, maybe minimum wage jobs, and there it's entirely possible. Uh, I'd like to yield uh, for a moment to a uh, gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Representative Scarborough. I just had one final question. I've got to run. Um, have you had a chance to share some of your studies and information in your uh, statistics and so forth with uh, uh, Secretary Reich or other people in the administration? I assume he's, he's heard of them. Uh, other than that, I don't know. No, you, have, you haven't been called. I mean, you, no. you haven't had a chance to. Okay, no. thank you. Any other questions? For uh, ju just, just a, a final conclusion. I, the, the, the suggestion by, by some, and even uh, following this study, the suggestion by some that uh, raising the minimum wage would actually increase jobs is, is, strikes me as is fair, fairly ludicrous. And, and because this issue has been so demagogued, it, it seems to me that we need to break it down to the most general terms possible. Is it, would it be a safe conclusion to make, and again, talking in generalities, that somebody suggesting using, again, I'm asking you to, to look at, at the weight of evidence, the weight of studies over the past 20, 30 years or so, the conclusion that actually raising the minimum wage would increase jobs is tantamount to the suggestion that smoking cigarettes would reduce cancer? And, and I'm asking you again, uh, not your opinion, but just looking at the weight of studies over the past 30, 40 years on, on this issue. I think th th there's, there's only one study I'm aware of for the U.S. that finds that, and I imagine uh, there's at least one study which suggests that smoking uh, reduces cancer. And I'm sure many tobacco cancer, companies sure. have made more than one study on uh, right. the... Uh, I, I would point out, it's interesting, as this debate has evolved over the New Jersey, Pennsylvania study, uh, the position originally on that study was... Uh, by its authors, at least, that minimum wages certainly don't reduce employment and may increase it, um, and, and certainly the administration has, has, has preferred the latter view to some extent. Uh, since our study has come out, I think um, the authors have clearly backed away from any claim that minimum wages raise employment and now insist, the study says, that minimum wages have no effect on employment. 
you look at the paper, it's full of positive effects that are statistically mm -hmm. significant, so I'm not quite sure uh, where that comes from. But I don't think you'll get any, any economist on any side of this debate, barring perhaps a couple, right. uh, who will claim that minimum wage will raise employment. Okay. Well, I, I, let me just say for the record, I'm shocked and stunned that there's actually spin control in the academic community also. And with that, I will uh, uh, yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scarborough. Um, I had an additional question on the, the round that I had made, uh, didn't get a chance to ask, and I wanted to ask you about the uh, alternative proposal, Professor Newmark. Um, as you know, this year is an election year, and it looks to me like a lot of the debate that's going on in, is election year posturing. Um, in 1995, we have a, a sign back here that blows it up in large words for you, but President Clinton said, that raising the minimum wage is the wrong way to raise the incomes of low-wage earners. And this year, in 1996, he's asking us to raise the minimum wage in Congress. As you pointed out, facts are stubborn things, um, that the minimum wage has negative consequences for low-income workers. Um, the New York Times, the, not a bastion of conservative thought, certainly, but uh, the nation's leading newspaper, over the years has editorialized on this issue, and, and I want to put their editorials into the record for us. Um, I'll just read the headlines for you. In 1977, the minimally, the minimally useful minimum wage. Again, in 1987, the right minimum wage, zero dollars. Uh, in 1977, the cruel costs of the minimum wage. In 1987, again, don't raise the minimum wage, urging Congress not to raise it at that point. And then in 1988, the minimum wage illusion, talking about how the, the myths of benefiting the lower class income workers. And in 1989, the minimum wage a distraction. But now in 1996, an election year, once again, the New York Times headline reads, boost the minimum wage, urging Congress to take action. As you've pointed out, that action does have harmful effects upon some of the most vulnerable members in our society. It'll increase teenage unemployment, increases dropout rates, it particularly hits blacks and Hispanics, it harms the elderly, it hurts disabled workers who are looking for jobs. Now, I have been trying to think, is there a better way? Can we help people who are working at minimum wage levels to actually increase their take-home pay without costing these jobs? And I don't want to ask you to, to defy the laws of economics, but I wanted to present a proposal that I've been floating with my colleagues and see what your thoughts were on this. Basically, we would take all of the income tax and employment tax that are withheld from a minimum wage earner's payroll and paid by the employer. It's the FICA tax and, and the income tax withholding. Amounts to somewhere between uh, 15 and 17 percent on an average minimum wage earner's take home, pay that to them as after-tax income, have the employer receive a credit for their amount contributed to the Social Security Trust Fund so that the employee continues to make payments into that trust fund and then make up that revenue loss by reducing welfare and food stamps about 10 percent, which in Indiana means going from about $9 an hour down to about eight twenty-five dollars an hour in average benefits. To me, it looks like the employee wins. Their, their after-tax take-home pay goes up, actually on average, about one cent more than if we raise the minimum wage. And the employer doesn't have to lay off anybody or fire anybody or not hire new people because their costs don't go up. Welfare is reduced, thereby increasing the incentive for people who are able to work to leave public assistance and move into the workforce. I wanted to ask your opinion, should Congress consider this as an alternative, and, and do you think that would be a better way to actually increase take-home pay for people at minimum wage? By the way, we're going to couple it with an increase in the earned income tax credit for two parent families or, or one parent families with children and a reform that's been proposed by a colleague of mine, Mr. Hutchinson. So the proposal would be this minimum wage tax cut plus some changes in the earned income tax to increase income to families who are dependent on a minimum wage. And I wanted to ask your opinion whether you thought that was a good idea, a better idea than raising the minimum wage, and any other comments you had. 
Well, let me let me start out uh, on, on the financing side. There's no, there's no. Obviously, you could finance this in principle from anywhere, uh, and and I I, don't, I would not want to go on the record as as supporting uh, financing it out of lower welfare or if, or uh, or food stamps. Um, but that's obviously a possibility. One could one could just as well uh, reduce expenditures in other areas or raise taxes in other areas, if I can say that here. Um, it, it, the, the notion of reducing the income tax and the, and the Social Security tax that low-income workers pay is, is obviously a very sensible one that will increase the effective wage they earn and, and, and should encourage them to work. Uh, it seems perfectly reasonable, and it seems better than some other uh, programs that have been tried in the past, such as subsidizing hiring or something like that, which lead to all sorts of complications. I think the only thing you want to avoid in that is, is something that gives the employer a credit when that employer has a, a low-wage worker or a new worker working for them always gets into the potential problem of, of does the employer try to artificially keep up the number of low wage or new workers by perhaps churning through them uh, more quickly. But certainly uh, dealing with it on the income tax side f for the worker and simply uh, eliminating those taxes or refunding them to them would seem to be a, a reasonable way to go. And, and our, the intent of our proposal was not to give the employer credit so much as to make sure there was a credit on behalf of the employee being paid into the Social Security Trust Fund right. so that they were not penalized right. later when they tried to uh, withdraw from that fund upon retiring. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I have no further questions, but Mrs. Slaughter has joined us. D do you have any questions for Professor Newmark? Yes, uh, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I've heard a lot of reasons for not raising the uh, minimum wage, but the kids will all drop out of school because they're so jubilant about it, they will run out to work at a Burger King. It's never been one of them. Uh, actually, Dr. Evans and Turner, that I understand were invited but couldn't be here this morning, have sort of refuted your work and said that you've consistently underestimated the number of, of uh, young people who claim that uh, work's their major activity but, and, and are also in school, that 75 percent of them are indeed in school full time. Um, it really seems kind of surprising if, if your whole research is based on, on inaccurate uh, statistics on how many people are in school and are working. Um, but then how can you make this grand assumption that raising minimum wage again would drive people out of school? Their, their paper claims two things. Oh, it, there, there's two issues here. One is there are different ways in the current population survey, which are the data sources that we both, we and they use, to measure enrollment. We use data from May, and the May question is what is your major activity, to which work or school or other things can be the answer. They use more recent data, uh, sorry, data that start later in, in the early 80s, which provide an independent measure of enrollment so that you can be both enrolled and working. And working, okay. right. Which, um, don't you think in, in the case of teenagers that's usually the case? Uh, it's not entirely clear. I mean, the, 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 let me, let me, the, one, can, one can argue about which schooling measure is better. Um, theirs is more encompassing. Their schooling measure will include people who are taking a course and working full time. Ours will include only those who, who call it their major activity. Um, so that, that's, a, that's an open question. I, I, I certainly agree with you. In their paper, what they do is they, they claim that when you use this other measure, it, it's certainly true that you get more students enrolled using their measure uh, than major activity, as you would expect. They claim in their paper that when you take all of our data but instead measure enrollment using that other CPS question, um, that, our, that these results, in particular, uh, the increase in the proportion neither in school nor employed, uh, goes up, goes away, and, the, and, and their paper does show that. However. Uh, we've, we've gotten their data and examined it, and again, this is all going on so far in the, in the realm of unpublished papers, so one uh -huh. wants to be a little more cautious in interpreting it. Um, what they end up effectively doing, though, is using some data from May and some data from October. We've gone back and taken their data and taken it all from October, so the data are all defined on a consistent basis, and our results come back. Um, so it seems like, and again, this is, this is still an exchange going on between us and them, it seems like their result is simply, res uh, is simply a consequence of mixing up data from different months. Uh, and and what, what, what happens when you do that, if you, just so this doesn't sound so mysterious, um, well, I won't put up a slide because we're probably running out of time, is they end up misclassifying a lot of the minimum wage increases. They're using enrollment in October. Many of the minimum wage increases in their sample occurred between May and October. Uh, so they end up saying a minimum wage increase occurred a year later than it did pretty frequently or missing some of the minimum wage increases that occurred altogether uh, in the last year of the sample. So, so it just depends on what month you want to take the sampling. Is that what you're saying? No. If you, take, if, if you use either schooling measure but take all the data from the same month, you get our answer. It's only when you take the schooling measure from October and the other data from May, which is probably not a very sensible thing to do because you misclassify minimum wage increases, that the answer goes away. And that, that makes sense. You misclassify minimum wage increases, trying to detect an effect is going to be harder. 
Well, they claim there's no displacement effect. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and when, you, when you mix the data from the two months, that claim is correct. We and can you say there's no months. employment effect. There's a very small employment effect for teenagers. It's hard to find a negative employment effect for teenagers well, that's statistically significant. But that's a net effect. But if there's no displacement effect, and no, no, there's no employment effect, and if research shows that raising the minimum wage would increase productivity, why not do it? Because you said that in Business Week, didn't you? No, no, okay, hold on. That's one question at a time. They, they, okay. I, I don't agree that there's no displacement effect. The no displacement effect is an artifact of mixing the data from the two different months, I would claim. I have, I have, I have a table here. But, but with, as you with, said, if you did it the same, be, it would be the same, right? So basically, what you, no. as my, as my understanding is no, you what can you use either all the data from May, before. all the data from October, either of those cases, either enrollment measure, you do get a displacement effect. Okay? Could I quote you? Uh, if raising the minimum spurs technical innovations, it could make a real difference in productivity yes. and leave the economy better off, concedes David P. Newmark, uh, who writes in the minimum wage. Yes. So why not do it? Okay, this was. <laughs> I had a one-hour conversation with, with Aaron Bernstein sometime last week. I spent that whole hour trying to explain to him why his, his notion that raising the minimum wage would spur productivity growth was erroneous. And then he said, but if it does, would it be good? And I did respond in the magazine of the only quote he pulled out. Not a misquote. Yes, if it does raise productivity, it would be a good thing. There's, no, there's nothing in my statement, and there's certainly nothing in my mind, which suggests that, in fact, that would happen. Well, I tell you, after uh, Sunday's New York Times, I'm a little bit... Uh Skittish on economists. I hope you'll forgive me for that. But if you you're read not, the big the article one. on the uh, Week in Review page, basically, which said that all economists now have decided that downsizing just didn't work. You read? Did you read that one Sunday? I have not seen that yet. No. Right. Well, there is an economist, of course, here who disagrees with you again. Raising the minimum would lift productivity, and then you help those on the bottom, and it raises all standards and ensures that low-wage workers aren't left behind. Good for the economy and society alike. I like that conclusion. It's a nice conclusion. Okay. I don't know if it's true. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Mr. Shattuck, did you have any further questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, only one. I take it it's a nice conclusion. It doesn't happen to be yours, and you don't think it's accurate. Is that right? Yes, I, I don't subscribe to it, no. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Newmark. I, I suppose it would be fitting to conclude this panel. Uh, with an observation that, that my great aunt used to make when I would say I wanted something uh, very badly growing up. She said, well, wanting ain't getting, and that sometimes you might have a conclusion that we all want to be true, but if the facts don't bear you out, we need to pay attention to the facts and do what's best for those who are least, dis least advantaged in our society. I, I appreciate you coming forward today. I appreciate you bringing forward your data and forcing us to confront those facts and trying to do what is best for people who are working at the lowest wage in our society and trying to improve their position and allow them to have more uh, real income that they can spend for their families. Thank you. Thank you. Now on our next panel, if they would please come forward, we have invited numerous people who are actually out there in the real world providing jobs, working in jobs that are minimum wage and trying to seek employment for many of those who are the least advantage in our society. And so I appreciate all of you coming forward today to talk to us about the minimum wage and give your advice on what we should do in Congress to make sure that we continue to create these jobs and create opportunities for people to have new employment and entry level into the marketplace. With us today, are Ms. Melody Rain, who is a franchisee with Burger King, Mr. Don Baish, who is the Burger King employee, Mr. James Militello, who is co-owner of the Source Team, uh, Mr. Bernie Helgeth, who is founder of Bernie's Mailbag, uh, and I'm going to apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name, but as I read it, Mr. Talib Din Abdul Ukdawa who is the co-owner of Cornrows & Company, 
and the president of American Hair Braiders and Natural Hair Care Association. And Gail Robbins, who is a franchisee of Pizza Inn. I appreciate all of you coming forward today. Uh, if you would all please stand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record show that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Our first witness on this panel is Mrs. Rain, who owns two Burger King franchisees in Eureka, California. I appreciate you coming forward today and testifying with us on your experience and what the effects of a minimum wage increase will have in your efforts to create employment opportunities for young people and all people in our society. Mrs. Rain, thank you. Please share with us your testimony. Good morning. I appreciate also being here. I'm a mother of four children, and together with my husband, Jay, we own two Burger Kings, one in Eureka and one in McKinleyville, California. I'd like to thank the subcommittee f for the opportunity to express, as a small business person, how the proposed increase in the minimum wage would affect our business, but most importantly, the young people that we employ. I have provided the subcommittee with a written calculation of what the actual cost of the proposed minimum wage increase would be to our business. As you can see, our labor costs would increase by over 100000 per year just for our two restaurants. This is more than we took together, and we both worked full time as a salary from our business last year before taxes. Clearly, we simply could not absorb this loss, so we would be faced with the following choices. First, we could increase our prices, which would be against our better judgment since last year. Well, actually, it was three years ago. We reduced our Whopper to 99 cents and started selling meal combos. That increased our sales by 30 percent and our profits by 15 percent. The second choice we could have is laying off employees. And the third, we could increase prices moderately so we could retain business while laying off employees. And the logical choice and the one we plan on executing is the third. My guess is that most business owners would do the same, which would cause inflation. And then what good have we done anyone? My biggest concern and the reason I'm here today is for the jobs of our youth. As a mother of three teenage sons, I think it is very important for these young people to experience working at a job where they can learn the importance of being productive members of our society. As you can see from my calculation, a lot of jobs would be lost from the minimum wage increase just in our franchise alone. Our solution will be to raise prices for half of the increase and lay off workers for the other half. I will have to lay off a total of four full-time workers, that's for each restaurant, or eight part-time workers for each restaurant. There are about 6,000 franchise Burger Kings and company stores in the United States, which would equate to an estimated 24,000 full-time jobs or 48,000 part-time jobs. We would be forced to lay off teenagers mostly as they are almost always inexperienced and require more management time to teach them good work ethics. Only the most productive and hardworking people would survive the cut because we would have to give the same service with less people. When we first started our business 15 years ago, it took 16 to 18 people to work a busy Saturday lunch rush. Now we use 12 to 14. The la with the last minimum wage increase, we went to self-service drinks. There is no avoiding the fact that a further minimum in wage increase would mean even fewer job opportunities in our restaurants. My point is that the minimum wage may be 425 now, but it's only a starting wage. My hourly rate is 510 per hour, and my fellow franchisees around the country also have comparable average wages, some much higher. Why not leave what's working alone and let the market drive the wages? A large number of franchisees can't even get employees to come to work for them at $6 an hour because often we are competing with the welfare system. 
What incentive does a person have to work at a minimum wage job, whether it is $4.25 an hour or $5.25 an hour, if they can make two to three times that on welfare and not work at all? I have asked an employee of ours, Don, to join me here today to tell you his story. He was on welfare when he started working for us at minimum wage. Now he's a manager for us making almost 20000 a year. How many people will not get the opportunity he did if jobs are cut? In fact, every manager, one of our managers, excuse me, in fact, every one of our managers started with us as an hourly employee with no experience making minimum wage. Who states, who says that a minimum wage, excuse me, who stays at a minimum wage all their life? It upsets us to see the media and others portray small business owners as heartless people who care nothing about their employees. I am very proud of the hundreds of young people who have worked for us through the years that go on and get bigger and better jobs. The real satisfaction we get is when they come back to us and thank us for the lessons we have taught them about working and how we've made a difference in their lives. In closing, I would just like to say that our industry serves a valuable purpose. We are the first rung on the ladder for many workers. We take pride in seeing them progress to the next and the next, whether it be with us or with someone else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rain. I appreciate you coming today. Uh, Don, you're our next witness, and I appreciate you coming. Uh, you have quite a story to tell about your life, and I appreciate it. You should be proud to be here. And please share with us your testimony. Hi my, hi, my name's Don Beisch. I'm thankful to be here to testify. I was hired to work at the Eureka Burger King in May of 1993. I, was, I started at 425 an hour. After a few weeks, I had proven myself to the manage, management and was given a 50 cent raise. Because of a rocky relationship with my wife, I quit and was rehired a few times. But when I found out that we were going to have a baby, I started getting serious about my job. The manager wanted me to work more hours, but because I was on welfare and receiving financial assistance, my caseworker told me that until my baby was born, I could only work 25 hours a week or I'd lose some of my benefits. After my daughter was born in March of 1994, I was allowed to work full time and then I accepted a promotion to a crew leader starting at 5.25 an hour. A crew leader helps the manager on a duty on duty by making sure all the food prep is done, the breaks are all given out, and all the cleaning lists and checklists are done. After eight months, after I became a crew leader, I was offered an assistant manager job. I talked to my caseworker to see what benefits I'd lose, and she said that we would lose all our benefits furthermore. She said that if the job didn't work out, we would have to reapply for all the benefits again, which could take months. In March 1995, me and my oh, that did it for my wife. She refused to let me take the job. A few months later, in March 1995, my, me and my wife split up, and the assistant manager job was offered to me again. At this time, I took it. Jay and Melody had to start me out at 1,400 a month. This was 200 more a month than a normal started, normally started inexperienced managers. Just to just to match my crew leader pay and what I was receiving from welfare. The welfare system in at least Humboldt County discourages you from trying to get ahead and in fact discourage couples from getting married because you can get more benefits if you are single and the caseworkers tell you that. There needs to be a better way. They should gradually take it away until you're finally on your own. Jay and Melody, Melody and the managers and co-workers at Burger King believed in me and saw I could not see any more in myself, and I am very thankful for their help. Thanks to minimum wage job opportunity, I am completely off welfare now, and I have a self-esteem and pride again. I hope you think carefully about increasing the minimum wage because it will provide less opportunities for people like me to turn their lives around. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming today and, and sharing your experiences with us. Look forward to talking with you during the questioning period. Our next witness is uh, Mr. Jim 
Militeo, I hope I pronounced that correct, um, who is an attorney at Crystal Lake, Illinois, and co-owner of Source Team, a company which places individuals and disability disabled Americans in low-wage, entry-level jobs to help them become self-sufficient. Thank you very much for coming. May it please this committee, uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members. My name is James G. Malatala III, and with me today is uh, Bernie Helgeth, and we are from Crystal Lake, Illinois. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you and particularly thank Congressman Hastert for allowing us to come here today and testify on the behalf of uh, the effects of minimum wage and what that effect will have on small businesses and local government throughout the, the states. I, along with two other businessmen, am the owner of a small business called Source Team. Source Team is a resource management application company which provides employment opportunities for new labor force entrants. New labor force entrants would include people sorry. new labor force entrants would include people with disabilities and people that are in transition and people separated from employment that are seeking retraining and new careers. We also help create incubator type businesses for people who have disabilities such as Bernie and Bernie's mailbag and he'll discuss that with us a little later. Currently we have approximately 20 employees so as you can see we're a small business we're not that large. Of these 20 employees, about 70 percent are disabled. These employees are placed into companies and perform job tasks such as assembling and packaging, injection molding, and other various tasks and functions. It's our goal that we are to expand this company and grow even further. However, these and other disabled employees will be dramatically affected by the proposed increase in the minimum wage. Employment opportunities for the disabled will be reduced. For us, establishing work sites for these new entrants as a practical matter is difficult enough without increasing the minimum wage. By increasing the minimum wage, it will reduce source team's opportunity and effectiveness in placing these types of individuals into companies. An increase in price reduces demand. Therefore, by raising the price of minimum wage the availability of jobs will decrease. Thus, placement of these people into jobs will be that much more difficult for us. Minimum wage is the lowest salary that is acceptable to society. Although our business pays currently equal to and somewhat more than the minimum wage, I submit that an increase in the minimum wage will cause a direct and proportionate increase in the hourly wages that our business and other small business owners must pay. Escalating labor costs caused by an increase in the minimum wage will not affect the middle or the upper class workers. Rather, the disabled employees, the less educated employees, or the less skilled employees will become the targets of this welfare plan. If the minimum wage is increased as proposed, I will be forced to deal with government and the various wage and labor issues that would otherwise be left to us that are in a market-driven society. For example, I will now be compelled to increase employees' wages. If I do not increase an employee's wage, then the employee might leave. If that employee then leaves, I have to start the process of hiring again, training and paying additional costs. You have the additional costs and the time that's now associated with that left employee. If we don't increase the wage and that employee then decides to stay, we have another issue involved and that is the dissatisfaction that will occur with that employee because of his job performance and the belief that he deserves a higher increase in wage, which in, in, which in turn affects the product quality and the customer service, which then also has a, an effect. If additional wages are paid, then it takes money away from hiring new employees. A person is paid a wage equal to his or her contribution to that company's revenue. An increase in wages, which does not come from the marketplace, would cause us to potentially reduce the number of people we employ. No matter how you shuffle the deck, the disabled employees, along with the less educated employees and the less skilled employees, will suffer from this proposed increase. In addition to being a small business owner, I am a licensed attorney associated with the Law Office of Militello Zank and Cohen in Crystal Lake. Prior to this, I was an assistant state's attorney in the county of McHenry. I represent several fire protection districts within the state of Illinois. 
Each fire district has a minimum of 40 employees. As units of government within the state of Illinois, they are subject to the real estate tax limitation law, otherwise known as the tax cap. Essentially, the tax cap provides that a taxing district is limited to a yearly increase in real estate taxes of 5% for the consumer price index, whichever is less. This year, the consumer price index was 2.7%. Real estate taxes generate 90% of the revenues of a typical fire protection district. To my point, local government, such as a fire protection district, will also be directly impacted by the minimum wage increase and will be required to reduce their labor forces. A fire district's response time is very critical. If there's not enough employees to provide the necessary coverage for the district, that whole community will suffer. What we essentially have here is a ceiling and a floor now being put into effect. When you have a ceiling, which is the tax cap, and now you have the minimum wage, which is now your floor, and you increase that floor through the increase of the minimum wage, what you basically have is the districts being squished in the middle. This is much different than the public, uh, excuse me, than the private. In the private sector, they obviously can increase their cost of the product. Minimum wage is the standard by which employees and small businesses and local government evaluate their own salary and achievement. By increasing minimum wage from 425 to 515, the government has effectively eliminated an employee's achievement earned through salary increases. Artificial inflation of wages through an increase in minimum wage merely supports a welfare state and suppresses a market-driven economy. I would urge that you do not increase the minimum wage as proposed. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate <clears throat> your efforts on behalf of the disabled Americans to try to give them a better chance at being part of the mainstream in our economy. And I appreciate you expressing your concern on behalf of those who are truly le some of the least fortunate members in our society, but often many times the most brave and, and cheerful members that I've met in my experiences. Uh, Mr. Helgeth, I appreciate you coming today, and, and I'm curious and very interested in hearing about Bernie's mailbag, I understand you've worked uh, with Mr. Militello's group and can share from your experience how, how it's been helpful to you. Ch Chairman, if it's all right, with, uh, and I've talked with Bernie, if I could read part of Bernie's statement and then leave the last paragraph for Mr. Helgeth. Uh, certainly, and, and we can put the whole statement into the record as he Thank is. you. Mr. Chairman, my name is Bernie Helgeth, and I am from Crystal Lake, Illinois. Again, I would also, too, like to thank you and Congressman Hastert for allowing me to testify in the effects of minimum wage increase and the impact on me. I was a small business owner of a company called Crystal Distributors. On July 22, 1992, I suffered a stroke and became disabled. I have made substantial progress in my rehabilitation since that stroke. The need for a job in my life has become important to me. Trying to get back into the workforce has been a long and tenuous process. Source Team has helped me to establish an incubator business called Murney's Bail Bag and market that business to various companies within the community. Bernie's Mail Bag provides mail services to companies, for example, collating, stitching, stuffing envelopes, stamping, and setting tabs. It were very difficult to as attain employment when you're disabled. I feel that the minimum wage is increased as proposed. My employee opportunities will be mislimited even further. I words urge you don't not increase the minimum wage and 
as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, for your statement. And let me tell you, to all of us who, who have not been through your experience, we appreciate you coming forward bravely to join us today at this hearing. And uh, I wish you all the best as you uh, struggle with your recovery from the stroke. And good luck and good success with Bernie's mailbag. And thank you for participating today. Our next witness um, is a gentleman who is a small businessman here in Washington, D.C., and president of the American Hair Braiders and National Hair Care Association. I, and again, I'm going to apologize, but you can correct me. Uh, I believe the gentleman's name is Mr. Uh, Yukta. Is that correct? That's close enough. It's close. actually Ukta, and Ukta. I, answer, I answer to anything reasonably close. Uh, <laughs> so so, so you're right. I, I've been called a lot of things in my life, too. The, probably the, the most distorted was Minkowitz one time. So uh, I empathize with you, and, and thank you for coming, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, my name is Taladin Abdul Ukta. I am the co-owner of Cornrows & Company, a hair braiding salon located in Washington, D.C., Given the direct impact of the proposed unfunded mandate on small business operations, I thank this subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you today. I think it is vitally important that the United States Congress hear from small business owners like me, giving us a voice in this process. Over the last 16 of the 22 years I've been self-employed, I have discovered that one of the biggest obstacles to small business growth is simply government interference. I have spent 12 of those years just fighting state governments alone for the right to operate my business in the United States, free of nonsensical bureaucratic regulations. And now this, another unfunded mandate. I oppose not only an increase in the starting wage, but a mandated starting wage, period. It represents another death nail in the coffin of the United States' free enterprise system and makes a mockery of the notion that we can produce manufacture and exchange goods and services free of government regulation and interference. Because of federal legislation, the free market system no longer exists. And as a champion of that system, I oppose a mandated starting wage, and I most definitely oppose an increase in that wage. By forcing me to pay a mandated minimum wage with no consideration given to my business operations, market conditions, or feasibility studies, not only does the federal government imply its distrust of me as a business person, but it also says that as an employer, I'm not caring, capable, compassionate, conscious, or professional enough to evaluate my workers and substantiate their incomes accordingly. I must have those terms dictated to me. This Congress is willing to risk the employment of low-skilled people, the purported beneficiaries of the proposed wage hike, for a few fleeting moments of glory in the upcoming 1996 election, an unconscionable trade-off to the entry-level American worker. For the people of the District of Columbia, the impact of a mandated wage hike will have implications well beyond the political grandstanding of those interested in creating feel-good election year legislation. First, minimum wage workers know that the more they earn, the more the federal, state, county, or local governments will claim for taxes. Second, while the impact of the wage hike on the take-home pay would be negligible for minimum wage earners, the impact of the mandate on employers would be substantial. As payroll dollars increase, so does employers' calls for workers' compensation, Social Security, Medicare, and both federal and local unemployment compensation. Third, and this is very important, under existing law, Businesses operating in the District of Columbia are forced to pay a minimum wage $1 above the federal rate. Currently, in D.C., unskilled employees' wages start at $5.25 an hour. If Congress mandates President Clinton's proposal to raise the starting wage by 90 cents, I would be forced to pay an untrained, unskilled worker $6.15 per hour. How can I afford to bring in an unskilled worker when for the duration of the training period, they generate no revenue at all? What if this employee leaves during the training period? What about my losses? Where is my incentive to hire an unskilled employee 
who requires extensive and intensive training generates no revenue while costing me at a bare minimum $50 a day. Having lived under the district's mandated $5.25 an hour minimum wage law since October 1993, I am here with expert testimony that says I have not, cannot, and will not hire unskilled applicants at any minimum wage that is not in keeping with good, sound business practices. The cost of their employment would be too great a burden for my business to bear. It would be and has been more cost effective for me to hire a skilled worker, pay them more than the unskilled worker, and watch as the skilled employee generates at least three times the revenue than an unskilled employee ever could. Further, the mandated starting wage implies that competitive marketplace economics does not work, and that's simply not true. In every industry, there is a compelling need to keep qualified employees, and quality employees are paid based on their productivity and worth, not some arbitrary number selected by politicians. I started all of my employees at the minimum wage. After a training period in which they increased their skills, I increased their salary. Now all of my employees earn well above the minimum wage. The point is, I increase my employees' salaries not because the government commands me to do so, but because my employees earn their salary increases. I and other employers don't need this Congress or the President of the United States micromanaging our businesses. The question now becomes, where is my feel-good legislation? Where are the incentives and initiatives that induce me to hire more workers, open more establishments, invest in the district's stagnant economy. Since there are those who think they can run my business better than I can, here are my keys. My business is now theirs. Now, what are they going to do to make this increase? Should there be one more palatable for the small business owner already besieged by taxes and burdensome regulation? A federally mandated minimum wage implies that without the federal government's interference, the American worker earning the starting wage would be at risk. It further views me as some cold, heartless, money-grubbing tightwad who has become the scourge of the earth, looking to rip off my dim-witted counterpart, the minimum wage earner, at my every opportunity, that I purposely go out and seek to gain the most for the least, always looking for the upper hand, and that the role of my government is now that of a protector of poor Little Red Riding Hood from the big bad wolf. Well, Little Red Riding Hood may have had a job and been at work instead of out frolicking in the woods if the federal minimum wage had not been mandated. Please don't misunderstand me or misconstrue my comments. I'm not saying nor am I suggesting that this new wage hike proposal has started this country down the road to economic ruin. No, I'm not saying that at all. That clearly started when the first Congress decided that it had to regulate businesses in this country. However, what I am saying is this. We need a system that supports a free market economy and increases business growth, opportunity, and employment for all Americans. I urge this subcommittee and this Congress to oppose an increase in the minimum wage. Again, I thank the subcommittee, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ukta, and I look forward to talking with you during the questioning periods about your work with uh, many of the at-risk students and, and youth in the District of Columbia. Um, you've made one of the most eloquent statements on the benefits of free market capitalism for all of us in our society, and I appreciate you coming forward to making that. Our next witness on this panel is Ms. Gail Robbins, who, along with her husband, owns a Pizza Inn franchise in Greenville, South Carolina. Welcome, and thank you for sharing your testimony with us, Ms. Robin. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the chance to appear today on behalf of myself and the National Restaurant Association. My name is Gail Robbins. Nine years ago, there was a Pizza Inn restaurant franchise in Greenville, South Carolina, about to go out of business. I offered to take over the restaurant's loan, and my husband and I have owned the place ever since. I employ 23 hardworking people. 
I once employed a young African-American man who made pizzas for our customers. One evening, when we were working in the kitchen together, he came to me and said, I love this job. When I asked him why, he said, because it keeps me off the street. I thought that what this young man said explains better than anything why I'm here today. As a matter of fact, I think my employees ought to be here testifying, not me. If the starting wage is increased, I know that a lot of people around this country who could be making pizzas and learning work skills will instead, instead be on the street. <clears throat> I pay all my employees more than the starting wage. If the starting wage goes up, I won't lay off anyone. But because I only have a profit margin of about 4%, I'll make changes that might not show up on government's economic reports the next day or the next month. I'll wait until someone moves on to another job, and then I won't hire someone to take over or place. I'll schedule servers for fewer hours, and I'll see if I can save money on labor costs some other way, like buying my broccoli and cauliflower pre-cut instead of having one of my kitchen workers cut it up herself. When you terminate one of these positions, you terminate an opportunity. I know from experience when, what a lifesaver the right opportunity can be. My life became intolerable, and I left home at 15. I simply would not have survived had it not been for the people willing to give me the opportunity to work, first as a dime store waitress and then as a truck stop waitress. I ended up in New Jersey and got a job making 47 cents an hour as a waitress at a Howard Johnson's when I was 19. The people at this Howard Johnson's took me under their wing and became my new family when I needed one desperately. They were my employers, my friends, my family, and my mentors. They told me that if I had a good attitude and worked hard, I'd turn things around. They told me I didn't need to have experience. I needed to get experience. They told me I didn't need to know about business. Excuse me. I'm sorry. That's all right. I needed to learn the business. As you can see, I did turn things around. Forty years later, I own my own successful restaurant, and I'm pursuing a college degree in business and economics. Now, I'm trying to turn things around for a lot of people who need an opportunity to improve their lives. About four years ago, I was taking a class and one of my fellow students, a young woman who had a learning disability, didn't read very well. So I chipped in half the cost of an electronic dictionary for her. I wanted to help her help herself. Well, she remembered me and came in the store after the semester and told me she needed a job to, in order to complete her nursing degree. She's a single mother of three who receives food stamps and Medicaid from the government. But I've helped her to become more and more independent. I gave her a job preparing the salad bar, and now she's doing some cashiering. Last week, I asked her how long she wanted to work, keep working for the restaurant. And she said, as long as you'll let me, Miss Gale. This is how my business works. If I hire someone and they're an asset to my company, you'll keep them and promote them and pay them well above the starting wage. All the while, they'll cost the government less and less in reduced welfare assistance. I hired a 16-year-old in 1990 to fill a starting wage job washing dishes. She supplemented her income with some money from the earned income tax credit. All the while, she worked hard, learned what she needed to learn, 
and now she's the assistant manager supervising all the other employees and making sure everything runs smoothly. She's only 22 and no longer relies on the earned income tax credit because her wages have steadily risen. What all these people have in common is that they're receiving the best kind of job training available on the job training. They're not receiving the kind of training I received they are receiving the kind of training I received at Howard Johnson's four decades ago, training in life. And raising the starting wage isn't going to help me provide this kind of training. I think instead we need to do something about the welfare system. I was talking to a person with the Employment Commission the other day, and he said some of these people with whom he deals with our second and third generation welfare reciprocants. He said a lot of them are completely unfamiliar with the importance of showing up to work on time, helping out with whatever is necessary and dealing with customers. Maybe we can do more to move people off of welfare and teach them these skills. I know that if some states, welfare offices are starting programs where the government pays the wages of welfare reciprocants during the first weeks of their jobs. People learn workplace skills for a while at no cost to the employer and then secure a paid job with that business or another business when the grace period is over. This is something I hope we can try in South Carolina and try nationwide or we could give a tax credit to employers who hire the people who are the most disenfranchised with the, from the workforce. But I think there's only one thing we can give our young people today that is more important, opportunity. I want all my employees to know what they can become if they work hard. I keep a magazine article describing the story of my life on a bulletin board in my restaurant. I remember when one of my dishwashers asked me why I never mentioned money in the article. He wanted to know why I never said, I'm successful now because I'm earning a lot more than I did when I started. Well, I told him, it's about more than just money. It's about opportunity. Let me keep these kinds of opportunity. Let me keep these kinds of opportunities by keeping the starting wage at its current level. Thank you very much. Mrs. Thank Ryan. you. I would like to apologize because I did not face you. I faced the empty people up here. <laughs> That's quite all right. Because this is where my message needs to go. Thank you. I, I share your desire. You all have come forward today and given us testimony about the effect of raising the minimum wage on real people, uh, real people who are on welfare, real people who are struggling to earn a living, real people who are disadvantaged in this society. And I want to say thank you for the opportunities you've created for people in your businesses. Let me ask Mrs. Rain and Mrs. Robbins, how many people do you think you've given a start with a minimum wage job over the lifetime of the businesses you've owned? Well, <clears throat> I do all the W-2s for our business. We go through about 150 employees a year, so over 15 years. What is that, 1,500 employees? I would say out of, out of those employees, majority of them are in high school or going to college. There's probably only about maybe a third that are, are uh, in the middle where they're not living with a parent and they're not going to school and they're trying to earn a living on their own. But out of those, many of those are the ones that are our managers and crew leaders. 
would really go on to take advantage of the opportunity. Amen. How, how many would you estimate, Mrs. Robbins? I don't really know because my husband in my books does my accounting, but I tell these young people when they come to get their job that if they stay with me, that uh, they're lucky to have me because uh, I have high standards and I give them the right, util or right equipment to go on to other jobs and do a good job. And because probably I came up hard and I was poor. And uh, there's a lot of knowledge in being, having life experience. It's a lot, a lot to be learned from that. Both of you mentioned the opportunity for people who are on welfare or benefited from the earned income tax credit. And Mr. Bysh, you mentioned that you struggled when you're first employed and as you moved further along in the advancement and that it, at various times it almost appeared that the welfare system was holding you back. And, and I was going to ask you, in your opinion, do you believe that that the caseworkers and that the um, people who administer our welfare system encourage young people to, to take a job and become self-sufficient, or does it work against you? Well, I feel I was being kept back when I wanted to become a manager because <clears throat> the, uh, they would, you know, cut my benefits back. Uh, I'm, like, lost with words here. Uh, I just feel that the welfare system would, you know, would, they, they ask you to get out there and work, but you could make more money actually being on welfare than you can working, because that's the way I feel. Do you think you obviously chose to work rather than get more money and being on welfare? Um, are you glad you made that choice? Yes, I am. I'd rather, you know, the way my dad taught me, wherever there's a will, there's a way. Amen. And you certainly have the will. Yes. What would you say as advice to, to people around the country who are struggling with this? Uh, what, what would your advice to them be? Just to keep trying, you know, wherever, you know, that, where there's jobs out there, just keep trying, you know. I've, you know, I've been on my own since I was 15 years old. You know, my family was, you know, on welfare all their life, too. And just keep trying and just keep working towards what you want to be. Now, let me ask you, because in, in Congress, we have to make tough choices. And, and I think the evidence today is the choice we're being asked to make is to increase the minimum wage and, and help some people to have more take-home pay, but at the expense of costing some job opportunities. And so that... Some people, like yourselves, who want to start working won't be able to find some of those entry-level jobs. Uh, do you have any advice for us in those trade-offs? I just say, you know, just be honest with yourself and, you know, if you just keep working hard and you can work up from where you start out to keep, you know, I proved myself in three years, I'm a, you know, manager now from being an employee. So it can be done. It can be done. Uh, let me ask all of the panelists today, and I described earlier at the first panel an alternative that we've been working on. Actually, it looks like my time has expired, so I will come back on the second round of questions and ask you what you think about that alternative, which is essentially a, a tax cut whereby the employees get paid all of their earnings and there's no withholding for them, and the employer does not have to increase their cost to get a real take-home pay increase. But let me come back to that in, in the second round of questioning. Let me turn now to my colleague uh, from Minnesota, Mr. Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, first question, I guess, for Mrs. Rain or, or uh, uh, the gentlelady who's in the pizza business. I, I think there's a misguided perception right now that, uh, that the fast food business is a, an enormously profitable business. Can you talk a little bit about the margins? You said you've been in the business for 15 years. Is it tougher today than it was 15 years ago? Or 
Yes, my profit margins have dropped about 4%, uh, mainly in labor. When we first started, um, acceptable percent for hourly labor, that's not including their fringe or, or any of that sort of benefit, but just pure hourly labor was, the standard was 12 to 13 percent um, of your sales. Now it's 15, 16, it's going up to 17. And, and, so, our, and so if the minimum wage goes up, that percentage will go up even more. Yes, yeah, so we're absorbing some of that in our profits besides laying off people and besides raising prices. We're doing all three in, in combination. Yeah. Our profit margin was 4% last year because uh, right before I came here, we checked. It was 4.24. Uh, I think the year before it was a little bit better, but uh, we've been in business 10 years, and my dream is to help uh, minorities are people who have had a hard time in life uh, become part of the business and maybe do more stores but we haven't been able to really get ahead because our margins are so low that we just uh, actually keep ourselves in business and my husband and I work in the store so uh, uh, we can uh, alleviate some of the costs because we do work in the store Mrs. Robbins, I, I do want to share one other thing that you said earlier, and, and it is unfortunate that uh, some of the members uh, who maybe need to hear this testimony the most are, uh, are not in their seats today. Uh, it, it seems to me that perhaps that we have, uh, the Congress has sort of, we're about to buy into this notion that, that there are no consequences to this decision, that uh, we can somehow grant this pay raise and that there won't be a consequence. And unfortunately, some of the people who are supporters of the strongest supporters, and I, I must confess that I'm still somewhere in the, in the middle on this. I haven't decided how I'm going to vote on the issue. Uh, and it depends on how it's, it's framed and what all is included, and I suspect uh, that negotiation is going on at levels above my pay grade. But uh, uh, I, I also apologize that more of our members aren't here to hear this testimony. Uh, Mr. Yukta, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name correct, I, I was especially interested in yours because, as I mentioned earlier, I serve on the Washington, D.C. Oversight Subcommittee. and, and uh, you seem to be saying that Washington, D.C. has created its, for itself even worse problems than we might have otherwise. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the economic problems here in the district and, uh, and how, at least from your perception, the, the minimum wage has played a role in that? Back uh, in 19, early 1993, the district uh, entertained legislation to automatically raise the minimum wage in D.C., one dollar above whatever the federal minimum wage is. That law is still in effect. Uh, the point I was trying to make is, is that <clears throat> since October 1993, I have been at $5.25 an hour. What I've had the opportunity to do since October of 93 is to take, look, take a look back at at least 45 applications that I accepted for a particular position, uh, the, the majority of the positions in my own business. Of those 45 people since October 93, I only hired two. 43 of them I didn't hire at all because I could not afford to pay them $5.25 an hour. I mean, so the, the mathematics is real simple. I have people who are more skilled, who earn anywhere from sixteen dollars to $19,000 a year, but who generate 60000 If I bring in an unskilled individual, I'm going to pay them roughly 13000 a year, but they're only going to bring me in twenty. I mean, the mathematics is, 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 is quite simple. So what I have had to, to resign myself to is bringing in more experienced folk. What I have personally done is I have written to members of the city council uh, labor committee asking them to repeal this legislation because quite frankly uh, six dollars and fifteen cents an hour is not something that I'm looking forward to I can tell you now I will not hire anyone that is unskilled that does not have the ability to be able to come in and immediately be able to service my customers is it, is it fair to say that you speak for an awful lot of small business people in the A district? lot of small business people outside of the salon businesses. I've talked to um, 
auto body repair people, those folk who hire high school students to do uh, some of the cleaning and some of the labor work uh, around their mechanic shops, they can't afford to pay anybody $6.15 an hour to train them how to do something that they'll just find other ways to get the job done. So, so your conclusion then is if, if we raise the minimum wage, you will actually make things worse for the District of Columbia? There's no question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutnick. Uh, let me turn now to our colleague from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know that I have any questions for this panel, but I want to say a few things. I was elected to Congress for the first time in this last election in November. I began serving here in January a year ago. In the time that I've been in the Congress, I have watched a lot of panels come before us and testify. I have listened to people as educated as Alan Greenspan uh, and as diverse as Bruce Babbitt, Secretary of the Interior. In my entire tenure in the United States Congress, I have never heard a panel as substantive, as eloquent, and as knowledgeable as this panel. Mrs. Rain, Mr. Bache, Mr. Miltello, Mr. Helgeth, Mr. Ukta, Ms. Robbins, you have done, if America will listen, a tremendous service. Your eloquence, your brilliance, your courage in coming forward, to me, is a message that every American needs to hear. They tell us, as members of the Congress, particularly as members of the Republican majority in Congress, we ought not to fight this issue. Seventy to eighty percent of all Americans believe an increase in the minimum wage is a good idea. I would beg C-SPAN to play the testimony of this panel over and over and over again. If there's any justice in America, NBC and CBS and ABC and C-SPAN and CNN will play bits of each of your statements. You are each so knowledgeable. Mr. Ukta, I do not know whether you have a graduate degree in economics, but I can assure you, you could teach every member of this House of Representatives and every member of the United States Senate a lesson in economics. Your testimony today about the effect of the minimum wage on your business and about the economic regulation of your business, about its impact on the District of Columbia. I wanted to ask you what the unemployment rate is in the District of Columbia. I will bet you that with the laws that are in place, it's higher than other places nearby and that you could at least avoid that extra dollar by moving to Virginia or Maryland and may indeed, if we arbitrarily government mandate a one dollar increase in the minimum wage, a political solution to make ourselves feel good, which will hurt those young people at the bottom rung of the economic ladder, you may indeed well do that. It seems to me that uh, I wish that every single member, I, if I could just have one wish in this entire Congress on this issue, it would be that every single member of the United States House of Representatives be forced to listen to just your testimony. Ms. Robbins, I didn't quite understand why you kept looking that way through your entire testimony. I didn't know if that was because the paper was set off to that side. It is to me an absolute outrage that not a single member of the minority, not a single advocate, Republican or Democrat in this Congress, of this stupid idea of an increase in the minimum wage came and listened to your eloquent testimony. For all of the people, and I don't know, you couldn't see it, there are 50 people that walked into this room after your testimony. I hope they will all go home tonight and watch C-SPAN and see this testimony when it is re-aired. Every American from this one panel alone could learn a simple economics lesson and would understand why the proposal to raise, raise the minimum wage is nothing but pure good, as you said it, Mr. Ukta, feel-good politics. You are eloquent, Mr. Uh, uh, Helgeth, your courage in coming forward and speaking on behalf of the handicapped and the disabled who need entry-level jobs, uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. It's obvious the courage and the difficulty it took you to come forward for each of you that creates jobs, for each of you that came here, uh, for each of your eloquent statements, I say thank you. And I will tell you that I am personally going to do what I can to force the 20 or 21 members of my party who believe in this dumb idea to listen to what you have had to say today, because it was marvelous. Sir, I'd like to say something. There's a song Simon and Garfunkel used to sing. It was from The Boxer. Uh, and it says, a man only hears what he wants to hear, and he disregards the rest. Well, we didn't even get the respect of these people to come and listen to us. And we have a lot of small, we have a lot of problems in the small business world. We, sometimes our turnover at some of our restaurants are 300% a year. 
We hire people that only stay four days a week. I do not know why the minimum wage is on the table because I honestly don't. Most people, uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, entry level is $8 an hour. Greenville is more than minimum wage. There uh, is a, a young man came to me for a job this weekend. His mother actually came and got the application, and I hired him because he, his mother came. But uh, he filled out the application and told on the application it said he entered the workforce at 17, or maybe it was 16, at $6 an hour. Uh, he left that business at $6.50 an hour. Uh, and I told him, I said, I can't pay you that. I said, I'll start you at 475, and then we'll talk about it in two weeks. Uh, and, uh, but the funny part about it, the restaurant he left, he's been out of work, I think, for about six weeks because it went out of business. And it's a major chain, too. Uh, there is a, a, a reprint of, uh, United Technologies puts out reprints of various aphorisms that I have framed and put in my office. One of them says, if 10,000 people believe in a dumb idea, it is still a dumb idea. Raising the minimum wage is, in fact, a dumb idea. Mr. Ukta, I will tell you that if the Dole campaign has any sense at all, they will hire you to be a national spokesman on the issue of the free market between here and Election Day because you are an eloquent spokesman for the free market and for what made America great. Your statement alone should win this debate today. I just want to thank you all. Sir, I will hire you as my manager. <laughs> <laughs> There's always another life, isn't there, John? I, th I can't agree more with what my colleague, Mr. Shattuck, has said today and, and want to second that. Even, as I'll point out once again, even President Clinton last year realized, as he put it, it's the wrong way to raise the incomes of low-wage earners. And it's time that we put politics aside and try to do what's right for all Americans in this country. Let me now, uh, in the second round of questioning, ask you about this alternative proposal that we are trying to work on. I'm sure we're going to be able to vote on it because it's so new and frankly it's one of those ideas that makes so much sense that it's sometimes hard to get people in the minimum wage. We increase people's take-home pay by not taking their taxes out, letting them take that home in their salary, the businesses don't have to increase their costs so they can continue to make the same hiring decisions. And we reduce welfare by about 10 percent to make up the revenue loss. Let me ask each of you, and I'll start with you, Mr. Ukta. Do you think that's a good idea? Any suggestions, refinements? Uh, what is your comment? I've had this discussion uh, very preliminarily with, with some other folk. Um, I'm being very cautious about it because the devil is in the details. Um, I would also, I could support something like that. The problem that I see, and I think you spoke to it earlier, is that it's too much like doing right. And I don't, I don't expect for this body as a whole to do the right thing. I mean, it's, it, there's, there's, there's too much right about the proposal. It, it'll work for everybody. I mean, obviously, I can support it from an employer standpoint if it's not going to increase my bottom line. I think it's a great proposal for those people who find themselves at a lower minimum, you know, at the, the minimum wage. I would question whether or not folk are truly interested in any sort of real welfare reform. I mean, do we want to get these people off of the welfare rolls? Um, I think at the same time, and I, I think this committee needs to hear this, I'm, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place right now, and you had alluded to this, uh, this, this thing earlier. Uh, I have been asked by some kids that I work with, and when I say kids, I'm talking about youth between the ages of 15 and no older than 17 years old, to start a business for them. And I want to do this. I'm prepared to do this. What I am not prepared to do is to start them off, and this is going to be a lawn maintenance business, to start them off at $6.15 an hour. The proposal that you have introduced here, where they would see more of their take home, 
where I would see less cost to me, that is less labor cost to me, if, if it could be done within the next couple of weeks, I'd be right down here at your office every day supporting that proposal because they're ready to go to work. They're ready to do something. I'm hesitating now because I'm not sure, and I may take the, the, uh, the, the congressman's suggestion and just move into Maryland and Virginia where the minimum wage is lower, find an address there that I can use for that business so that I am not subject to $5.25 an hour. I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. And are those at, some of the at-risk youth here oh, in, in I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, these, I, I work with kids who've been adjudicated through the court system. Um, th there's no question about them being at risk. I mean, they, they've already been adjudicated through the court system. Um, they're not bad kids, but they just need opportunities. Um, and as a businessman, I'm in a position to do that. In the last 16 years, I've hired over 300 people. Of those 300 people, 12 of them have gone on to open up their own businesses. They're now hiring other folk. A lot better record than the welfare office, I'll tell you that. A whole lot better. And I hope to be able to continue that. You, you provide the hope for those young people the same way the family in New Jersey did for Mrs. Robbins no four decades ago. And what I'm hearing you say to us today is if we raise the minimum wage here, and in D.C. you have to go up to 6.15 an hour, you won't be able to provide that hope for those young people because it just doesn't make sense economically. It, it won't. I mean, what, what I'll have to do is I'll have to look for more skilled folk. Because I've got more skilled folk, I'm going to have to pay them more money. Because I'm paying them more money, I'm going to have to charge more money. I mean, it, it's... It, I, don't, I don't want to make this process so convoluted. I mean, that's why I try to keep, keep it as simple as possible. It's, it's A through Z, and I mean, you can take it one step at a time. I mean, it's a true domino effect. And I don't know how, I, I don't want to give you some theory of economics that, you know, that just boggles the mind. I mean, that's why I'm trying to keep it as keep basic as possible. Common sense dictates yeah. the outcome. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that if I can go through the rest of the panels on that same question about our alternative. Uh, Mrs. Robbins, do you have a view on, on the alternative? Okay. I'm not sure I understand yours because I think I've got yours mixed up with Mr. Hutchinson's. Uh, and uh, I think his, or, or maybe my husband says I have it mixed up. But anyway, uh, if, if you pay people the earned income tax credit, they get it when, in one lump sum at income tax time. Uh, if you give these people this wage every week, they would be much better off because when you get one lump sum of money, you go out and spend it, and then you don't have any more. So, and I've, in my business, I've seen this happen many times with people. So, uh, and uh, I would really like to see systems set up like the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. I think they go into low-income areas and help people out there because we definitely need something. We don't need a minimum wage when we don't need it. We right. don't need a minimum wage. Because the marketplace takes care of it. Uh, actually, the proposal is combining my idea of increasing each week the take-home pay with Mr. Hutchinson's idea of the earned income tax credit. Uh, but I will share with him your insight that if you could spread the earned income tax credit out over the paycheck as well, or part way through the year, that, that's an even better way to do it. This, just so you, the way to think about it is, when you fill out an employee's pay stub, and, and I've got an intern in my office in Indiana who repairs Harleys, and he handed me his pay stub when he was working at minimum wage. He worked a, a little bit less than 20 hours, made a total of $83 and some change. When you took out the FICA tax, the federal tax withholding, and the state tax, he got to take home $68 and some change. Now, my proposal would be to say, let you pay that FICA tax directly to your employees, let you pay the withholding on the income tax directly to the employees, and the take-home would end up being $86 and some change, because you also pay some FICA tax that the employee never sees on the pay stub. Therefore, each week, it would be about a 20% real increase 
in their take-home pay, it wouldn't cost you, the employer, any more money because you're simply not paying the taxes to the government, you're paying it to the employee. And we would figure out a way of crediting their Social Security so that they don't lose any credit on that by taking from the welfare program and crediting it into the Social Security Trust Fund. So that, and what we're doing is combining that idea with Mr. Hutchinson's on the earned income tax. Uh, I think that would be better. Uh, I would like to tell you something. Uh, when I was 51, I went back and got my GED. And uh, I was watching the uh, government on television. And uh, I decided I would go to school and get a degree in economics and business to find out where all my tax dollars was going after I became a small business person. And uh, that's basically why I'm here. And uh, right now, I think the percentage is 45% taxes that we pay overall, state, uh, gas, uh, sales, everything. But we really need to reevaluate re the system because uh, it seems like we hurt the people we try to help. And uh, even with the taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baish, do you have any, any suggestions? Do you think it would be a good idea to let people take home their whole paycheck? Well, it sounds like a good idea, but I don't know much about the subject, so I'm going to pass and let my oh, okay. employer talk about it. All right. Mrs. Ray? I understand your proposal, and I also understand Mr. Hutchinson's. Um, I think they're both good proposals, but I... I I don't know if they limit the amount of children you have. I mean, I don't support anything that, that encourages you, you know, to have children to get more benefits. Um, I think if, if young working Americans are going to be on this program, they should have some kind of education on, on how, to, how important it is to be honest in their job, how important it is to show up to work on time, um, how important it is to to work while they're there and not stand around and talk. I mean, this, these are things we deal with every day. Is I, I get a lot of kids you know, that come in, they learn from other employees or other friends that they can go on welfare and they don't have to work. Um, these, these people don't have any work ethics. And why isn't the welfare system teaching them or having somebody like Don come in and talk to these people on welfare and say, I did it, you can do it too. That's what we need more of, is, is to encourage these people. They, the upbringing they've had, they don't know what it means to be honest or, or how that feels to, to be proud of yourself, to do something for yourself. To, it, as, it's got to be, it won't do any good, is what I'm saying, unless there's some kind of education with it. It goes with it. And, and as Mrs. Robbins pointed out, those are lessons in life. And, and you learn those lessons in life when, when you are working and when you're, somebody has confidence in you and gives you the responsibility to do a job, uh, to take responsibility for managing other people. But my point is, you can, we can only help that person so much. I mean, right. when they're stealing from you, even though you know that they've got kids at home that are hungry, you can't let them keep working for you. You have to say, I'm sorry. I can't employ you. It's a hard decision to make. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Militello and uh, Mr. Helgeth, do you have any views on, on this alternative tax credit? Uh, this alternative uh, program that you proposed, I see it as a win-win opportunity for both the employer and the employee as you've got it proposed today. I, one caveat I would say is that uh, I would have the same hesitation as this group um, as far as the details of it and, and how the, the funding and, and the rest of it would be managed. But as the program as it's presented today, I could see it as a win-win opportunity because here you have an employee who has, now you've just increased their wages. So as a result of that, you're going to have better job performance, performance out of that person. You're going to have better quality control issues. You're going to have better, better customer service relations. So from an employee standpoint, the product and the, uh, the relationships are going to be that much better off. Um, the employer standpoint, which is the other win of the, the coin, is what you're saying is, is there's going to be no additional cost involved there. If there's no additional cost there, 
the employer is going to be happy with that program as well, uh, and, and it's, going to, it's going to trickle down through the rest of the business. And hopefully that will carry on through the, the industry as well. Uh, and again, I left my caveat as to you know, the details of the program and how it would be funded. You're wise to be checking into the details. We've, we've noticed in a lot of regulatory programs the devil is in the detail. But I, I think we're working those out and trying to get it go forward. Uh, Mr. Helgeth, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Well, Mr. Shattuck or Mr. Gutnick, do you have any further questions for this panel? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any further questions, but I, I just, this has been, and I would agree with uh, Congressman Shattuck, that this has been a very, very interesting panel, and I, I wish that more people had had a chance to, to listen. Uh, in some respects, it, it just reminds me of something that uh, I think Jefferson said over 200 years ago, and he said that uh, those who would trade freedom for security will lose both and deserve neither. And this really is a fairly fundamental debate between those who believe that the federal government's uh, responsibility is to guarantee opportunity and those who believe that the federal government's responsibility is to guarantee this uh, minimum welfare state system. And, uh, and, and it's, it is a fundamental debate, and it's a difficult one, and it's particularly difficult, I think, because, you know, despite your best efforts and the best efforts of a lot of good economists who have, who have shared some pretty good information, uh, the people we work for, 78 percent of them at the last poll, say that we ought to raise a minimum wage. And uh, I don't know if there's time to uh, get the information out to the American people to uh, at least to dissuade them. So it, it's very difficult for those of us on this side of the table. Mr. Yuk, did you want to add something? I just need to add something, too. I mean, the, the problem in the debate is it's not the economists that are paying these people. We are the people that are sitting here. And this is the first opportunity that any of us have had to speak to any of you. We've talked to each other, and we've talked to our partners and our associates and our accountants and our lawyers. But I'm the person that signs the checks. I'm the person that pays the money. I don't care what an economist says. He's wrong. If he's not in business for him, ask an economist that has employees. That's who you need to ask. Someone that's got a business, like an accountant, he can tell you. But anybody else, they're not, they're, they're, it's not worth even listening to them. They don't know what they're talking about. We are the experts. Thank you. Thank you. Great. You are the experts. And, and I want to, again, say thank you for coming forward. Too often in Congress, we don't hear from real people on the front lines who are trying to create these jobs and provide opportunity. Now, as we call forward the next panel, I'm going to take a 90-second recess from the chair and come down and personally thank each of you for coming today. This has one, been one of the most moving and important panels that I've seen in my days in Congress. I will take a 90-second recess, and I'd ask the next set of witnesses to come forward, please. We'll be beginning the third panel of the hearing. If I could ask uh, each of the members of that panel to go ahead and take your seats up here at the table. Uh, the third panel, and, and this is going to be a tough job for them after that last panel, but it is 
uh, four professors of economics uh, who have differing views in general about the world and are here to share with us their insights and testimony about this issue. Could I ask Todd Gaziano to come up here for a second, please? Uh, if I could ask each of you, uh, with the exception of Professor Welch, to please rise. Repeat after me. Do you swear that the testimony you will give to this subcommittee today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, let the record show that each of the uh, witnesses answered in the affirmative. Our first witness on today's, this third panel, is Professor Finus Welsh, who is the Distinguished Professor of Economics and the Able Professor of Liberal Arts at Texas A&M University. Welcome. Professor Welch, thank you for coming today. Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Uh, I would like to begin by pointing out that uh, even though we heard from a group of employers a moment ago that the alternatives available to them uh, following the increase in the minimum wage are starkly different than the alternatives available to someone who in the absence of a minimum would earn even less. If we take someone who in the absence of a minimum who would earn less than the minimum and tell that person that we regret that you do not earn a wage that we see as acceptable and if you can't do better, you can't work, that person doesn't have a whole lot of alternative. You turn to the employer and say, we don't want you to pay a wage as low as a particular minimum and you can't hire people at that minimum. And they've got alternatives that will stretch as long as your arm. Uh, the most obvious, the one you heard about from everyone uh, here today, was they simply substitute for people who, in the absence of the minimum, would earn more in any case, people who are more productive. Uh, they can automate, they can subcontract, they can go to self-employed people, they can go abroad if it's a manufactured good, uh, and if nothing else, they can attempt to raise the price of their service or their product so that their employers, the consumers, can then switch and consider their alternatives. So it's a very uneven playing field. Now, that's all I'm going to say about theory. What I'm going to do now is just talk about the numbers associated with the last minimum wage increase. And one thing I, I want to say is that there are a few economists who've made a career uh, out of finding nothing when there's a lot out there. And I, I want to give you an idea of what the data looked like. Uh, the, the first graph that I'm going to describe uh, is just one that addresses the, the simple notion that you must have heard over the last year, year and a half, that the minimum wage has been being debated nationally, that the minimum is currently at a 40 to 50 year low. And one question you want to ask is relative to what? Now, relative to what matters in terms of employment decisions, in terms of who will be hired, uh, is the cost of minimum wage workers relative to other workers. So what I've done is graph since 1979 up through the end of 1973, the cost of, of the minimum wage relative to the median wage of men and women paid by the hour ages 25 through 34. Uh, you can see the rapid erosion in the minimum wage with no nominal inflation and wage increases during the 80s. You see the effect of the April 1990 and the April 1991 increases. Now, my graph stops in 93. Uh, it would have continued to decline as nominal wages have increased, uh, but it's probably somewhere around 1991 levels. So rather than the minimum wage being at a 40 to 50 year low, it's at a five year low. Uh, the second chart that I want to put up is just to talk about the relative cost of employing different kinds of people when the minimum wage goes up. 
Now, what I've done, Ed, if you think of people in a demographic group, in a particular age group, for example, they have a distribution of wages. And what I've done is order wages just as test scores are ordered in terms of percentiles. And I moved to the 20th percentile in the wage distribution uh, and said, let's look at what happens to the 20th percentile, the relatively low wage people amongst teenagers relative to young adults, young adults 20 to 24 years old. And notice during the later part of the 1980s, prior to the minimum wage increase, teenagers got cheap. And then the minimum was raised, April 1990, again April 1991, teenagers got expensive relative to young adults. Now, the next chart uh, asks, okay, what happened to employment? And there you see it, and in, this is one case that I think a picture is worth a thousand words, that during the late 1980s when teenagers were getting cheap relative to young adults, employment of teenagers became plentiful relative to young adults. As the minimum raised the cost of teenagers, you see the absolute perfectly timed coincidence of the drop in teenage employment. And by the way, it has not rebounded following uh, the recession of the 91-92 recession. Uh, I don't know how you can look at that graph and argue that there is not an employment response. Uh, the final point that I want to make uh, is in this following graph, and that is that the minimum wage is, in fact, an entry wage. What I've done is take the most recent data that I could lay my hands on by matching 92 with 93 data and, and say, let's look at people who in 92 were earning the federal minimum four and a quarter an hour up to 514 an hour. So they're the people who in principle would be affected if the minimum were raised to 515, which is the current proposal. And let's, these are people who in 92 were doing it, and let's look at them one year later and see what they were doing. Well, the blue bars show the average wage increase over a single year experienced by these people. The taller bar, and I can't tell you what color that is, uh, gives the percentage of people whose wage actually went up. You see that teenagers on average got a 15.8, 16% wage increase. It's not that big. If you move to the other age categories, you see that a, a much sharper increase in wages in a single year. Uh, overall, a 27% increase in wages in one year. This is just by way of pointing out, this is an entry wage. And given an opportunity to work, wages will increase. And the final thing that I want to say is that you as congressmen cannot mandate productivity increases. You just can't do it. But work will increase productivity. And you give people an opportunity to work, and they become more productive. And, and here's the simple evidence. If you go back to 1988 and you look at the same data when the minimum was taking a much smaller bite into the wage distribution, and was giving a larger number of people more of an opportunity, the average wage increase was almost 50% between 80 and 89 before the minimum was high. But now that it's, it's higher in relative terms, you don't see as much of a response. But you still see a terrific response, a 30% one-year increase on average, and this is across everybody in the, in the U.S. that I could lay my hands on in these uh, Census Bureau data. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Professor Welch. And actually, before we move on to the other members of this panel, I just want to, I can't resist interjecting in this. Could you, the, the gentleman working on the slides, could you try overlaying the cost of teenagers relative to young adults to the employment of teenagers relative to young adults? It doesn't quite work because the slides aren't matched up uh, on the... Actually, I'd like to rotate that and, and turn it bottom side up so it's an apples to apples comparison. There you go. See, when you rotate it, you're really showing you see, when the you, cost of young adults relative to teenagers and then the employment of teenagers relative to young adults. So, so it's, that a, it's a very strong correlation in, in the two. It's, on that. it's what one would call statistically significant. <laughs> <laughs> a term of art. Huh? Yes. Uh, thank you. The other quick question I want to ask you, what, what is the distribution, roughly, of these different population groups? Um, 
And, and I won't, I'll t I know what I think it probably is, but could you tell me, does it, is it level across those different age groups or? Uh, no, but one, one point that we are losing sight of, everyone talks about the concentration of teenagers in the low wage population, and of course it is disproportionately teenagers. But the demographics are changing rapidly. So if we go to the beginning of the period that I was looking at, 1979, by the time we get out to 93, we have half as many teenagers per capita as we did uh, in 1993. So when people talk about larger proportions of adults amongst minimum wage workers, they're really only talking about a demographic phenomenon that the baby boom is over. Yeah. Isn't uh, there now, an, a, when, an upward turn, though, that when you get to the senior of course. end of this, so that it, it goes down in the middle and then back up because seniors often are working part-time? And, and no, there's, and there's a very definite career. pattern amongst older people who will retire, and this year they're going to be permitted to earn, I think, $14,000. Last year it was 10000 But they'll retire, begin earning Social Security, and then they'll move back to an entry-level job. Uh, one calculation that I did run, uh, day before yesterday, I guess, uh, was to ask amongst minimum wage workers in 1994, by minimum wage, I mean four and a quarter up to 514, uh, what proportion were women working full time in households in which the woman, or families in which the woman was the head, and there was a child present? And that's one person in 25. So it's I just mm -hmm. thought I might add that. Thank you, Professor Welsh. Uh, I wanted to also enter into the record that our colleague, uh, Denny Hastert, who several members of, his, or two people from his district had been testifying on the earlier panel. Uh, Mr. Hastert, do you have any, any comments you want to put into the record? And thank you for joining us today on this hearing. Yeah, I, I will uh, uh, submit something for the record. Thank you. Uh, both of the gentlemen from your district were, were extremely persuasive and helpful in that panel, the previous panel. Our next witness on this panel is Professor Kevin Murphy, who is the George Pratt Schultz Professor of Business Economics and Industrial Relations at the University of Chicago. Uh, Professor Murphy, thank you for joining us today, and please share with us your testimony. Yeah, Mr. McIntosh and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today and giving me the chance to speak on the economics of increasing the federal minimum wage. My testimony today will address the general economic issues surrounding the proposed increase in the federal minimum wage. My discussion today will cover two basic issues regarding the minimum wage, the effect of a higher minimum on employment, and the distribution of gains and losses from increasing the minimum. Since others have spoken at length about neg the negative employment consequences of raising the minimum, I will focus only on employment effects briefly. Both economic theory and empirical evidence make the employment effects of a higher minimum quite clear. The law of demand, the most tried and true tenet of economics, tells that the externally po imposed minimum price for any commodity be will reduce the amount of the commodity purchased in the market. Labor in general, and low-skilled labor in particular, are not immune to this law. When we raise the wage of low-skilled labor, employers will hire fewer workers. The empirical evidence on the employment effects of the minimum wage support this. Evidence from a study conducted by Donald Deere, Finus Welch, and myself of the 1990 and 1991 two-step increase in the federal minimum wage, the kind of thing that Finus just showed you with the graph, implied that together these two increases in the federal minimum wage reduce the employment for all types of low-wage and low-skilled workers. In particular, the results of our study imply that these increases in the minimum reduced male teenage employment by 7 percent, female teenage employment by 11 percent, and black teenage employment by 10 percent. In addition, our estimates imply employment reductions for adults, that is age 20 to 54, males, females, and black high school dropouts, of 3 percent, 5 percent, and 6.7 percent, respectively. So obviously, the effects are not restricted to teenagers. Our estimates are consistent with those in the economic literature on minimum wages. Our estimates imply substantial employment losses from raising the minimum. In addition, since the current minimum of 425 is substantially higher relative to the level of wages in the economy than well, was the 335 minimum in 1990, a similar two-step increase in the minimum wage today would be likely to have an even larger negative impact on employment. 
Finally, since the employment loss is measured in R and other studies refer only to the net loss of jobs from a higher minimum, they significantly understate the true number of individuals that lose their jobs as a result of the higher minimum wage. This occurs because, as our previous panels illustrated, many jobs lost by the lowest wage workers when the minimum is increased end up being shifted to workers with higher earnings potential. These unmeasured job losses in the kind of statistics we are reporting here are an additional cost of the higher minimum, above and beyond that measured in our study, and represent a perverse form of economic redistribution from the lowest wage workers to others with significantly better economic options. Since the employment consequences of increasing the minimum wage are undoubtedly negative, any rational support for a higher minimum must be based on its perceived ability to redistribute income. Indeed, since raising the minimum wage actually decreases the size of the overall economic pie, raising the minimum wage could only be justified if such redistributive effects were sufficiently positive. Viewed in this way, the minimum wage is essentially a tax transfer scheme, and I should add one that's off the budget, and which I think is the reason why we're considering it here today, as opposed to a more open one. With total taxes in this case significantly greater than total transfers. Given that, you might ask what makes for a good tax transfer scheme? Tax transfer schemes are effective when, one, there is little lost in the transfer process, two, the benefits are well targeted at the desired population, and three, the taxes are either broadly based or focused on a group that would desire to tax. The minimum wage fails badly on all three counts. First, the large and net and even larger gross losses in employment described, uh, I described above and shown in Finest's graph imply that much is lost in the transfer process. Second, the benefits of the minimum wage are exceptionally poorly targeted. I think this is an underappreciated fact. Ninety percent of working age individuals in the lowest income households are not working at wages equal or near the minimum and therefore gain nothing and in fact must lose from a rise in the minimum. In addition, about one-third of minimum wage workers live in high-income households. In fact, if we look at the average income contribution of minimum wage workers by household income level, we see that it is remarkably constant. That's the, the first figure. Basically, what goes along the horizontal axis is each 20% of the income distribution on the vertical axis is just a relative measure of how much they contribute in dollars to their family income. And you can see there's very little contrast between the left-hand side, which would be the low end of the income distribution, and the top, which would be the high end. As you can see from the figure, income from minimum wage workers is in no way concentrated at the low end. Okay? In fact, if you go by comparison, seemingly odd policies, like transferring income to all individuals, regardless of their income level, that live in the five lowest wage states in the union, would be far more just redistributive. It would do much more to transfer income to the poor. In fact, the laundry list of more redistributive policies than the minimum wage is seemingly endless. And economically sound, more economically sound policies, like a revised earned income tax credit or efforts to try to reduce payroll taxes among low-wage workers, would be far more targeted. Most of the benefits would accrue almost entirely to the workers in those bottom two ends with almost nothing to those at the top. Now, you always have to remember, and I think this has been underemphasized in most of the discussion, that these transfers come at another cost other than just the employment losses. That is, they must be paid by somebody. Every extra dollar that goes to minimum wage workers is coming out of somebody else's pockets. It pays to look at where these taxes come. Basically, the two types of implicit taxes come from two sources. First, the higher prices paid by consumers of minimum wage products represents one element, while the employment losses suffered by the lowest wage rep workers represent the rest. The distribution of the implicit tax from the higher minim minimum is illustrated in my next figure, which gives the cost impacts of higher minimum wage on a range of industries. Unlike the transfer side, which is essentially uniform across the income levels, the implicit taxes implied by a rise in the minimum are highly concentrated on a particular set of products. In this case, food, personal and social services like health care, child care, 
and other sectors like retail trade. The second element of the tax, of course, is even more perverse. The fact that the higher minimum reduces employment for the lowest wage workers implies that a significant part of the transfer is paid by, for by perverse and indeed punitive tax on the lowest skilled. Indeed, all one needs to do to understand the distributional effects of raising the minimum is to go to a fast food restaurant or other low wage establishment. In essence, raising the minimum wage simply transfers income from those that buy hamburgers to those that make hamburgers. And there's been a lot made lately about family incomes and the effect on working families. If you go into the fast food restaurant and ask where are the working families in the fast food restaurant, are they behind the counter or in front of the counter, I think you'll see my point. Even abstracting from the employment effects, it is hard to see how such transfers are sound economic policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Murphy. I look forward to talking with you about our alternative as well on those same criteria. Our next witness is uh, Dr. William Niskanen, who is currently the chairman of Cato Institute. He uh, received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago and is formerly a professor at the University of California at Los Angeles. And perhaps at least most significant in my mind, he was uh, on the economic advisors to President Reagan. And I know uh, this wasn't in your prepared text, but you may also, if you have a chance, I'd be curious to hear your reaction to one of the arguments that's been made, or at least it's been reported in the press, that's been made to us in Congress about why we have to go ahead and raise the minimum wage. And that is that supposedly even Ronald Reagan didn't stand in the way of an 80% issue when the public, as ill-informed as they may be on this, still decide that it's a good thing to raise the minimum wage. Uh, and I was wondering, having worked with President Reagan, whether you thought that was accurate. Um, but we can get to that later on. Uh, Ms. Dr. Nitzkanen, thank you for coming and joining us, and please proceed with your testimony. Uh, Chairman McIntosh, members of the subcommittee, uh, you're to be commended for your serious attention to the effects of a minimum wage increase. One might hope that a decision on this important issue would be based more on the probable effects of this increase rather than on an uninformed ideology in partisan politics. My remarks today develop on two dimensions of this issue that are, have been mentioned but not developed by other panelists. First is that the long-term effects of a minimum wage increase are likely to be more severe than the short-term effects for two reasons. One is that an employment relation, whether it, uh, defined by an implicit or an explicit contract, is multidimensional. In, and it, uh, covers the wage rate, non-wage compensation, and several dimensions of working conditions. Over time, effective government regulation of any one of these conditions would almost surely change the other conditions in the employment contract. In the restaurant business, for example, an increase in the minimum wage might lead to a reduction of the amount of tip income that is, uh, that is collected by the waiters, the waiter's share of tip income. It's likely to lead to an increase in the use of split shifts, people working uh, t three or four hour shifts that are separated in time rather than a continuous shift. More generally, there would be general pressure to reduce uh, various forms of non-wage uh, training, uh, non-wage compensation, uh, training on the job, health insurance, pensions, parking provisions, and so forth, and other f forms of non-wage compensation. For these reasons, the long-term benefits to those who, are, who stay employed thus are likely to be lower than the mandated increase in the wage rate itself. On the other hand, the long-term cost to those who, uh, workers for whom the opportunities for legal employment have been reduced are likely to be higher than the short-run cost. A minimum wage job is usually the necessary first step toward a higher wage job for those with the lowest initial skills. Workers with higher skills can often start at the second or third rung of the employment ladder, but for those with the least initial skills, a minimum wage job is typically the necessary first step toward uh, a higher wage job. For this group, work, in the best, work is the best vocational training and most minimum wage workers receive a substantial wage increase within the first year of, uh, of employment. An increase in the minimum wage thus not only denies these workers a legal initial job, 
but it denies them the opportunity for the necessary on-the-job training uh, for a higher wage job. Second, an increase in the minimum wage is not an effective policy to increase the income of poor households. Uh, to document this point, I will use two tables from a recent study by Professor Richard Burkhauser at Syracuse University. And with your permission, I'll go to the slide over here to illustrate these points. Uh, Todd can help you with that if, if you want, Professor. Uh, let me go over here. I really need to point out some points. Oh, okay. Very good. This first table presents the distribution of workers by wage rate and by household income just prior to the latest increase in the minimum wage. And it illustrates the reasons why the minimum wage is so poorly targeted to uh, people from poor families. And the first is that there are a relatively small number of workers from poor families. About 14% of Americans are in poor households, but only 6.1% of workers are in poor households. So you have a, a disproportionately small share of workers from poor households. Second is that only about 26% of these workers in poor households are, were in the wage range affected by this latest increase in the minimum wage. So 26% of 6.1% is about 1.5%, which means 1.5% of workers uh, were affected. 1.5% of workers uh, at the time of the latest minimum wage increase were in poor families and were affected by the minimum wage increase. Second, only about 7.5%, 7 7.1% of all, all workers were affected by the latest minimum wage increase. And that means that 1.5% of the 7.1% means that only 22% of the benefits of the latest minimum wage increase in this last column, percent of affected workers, only about 22% of the benefits of the latest minimum wage increase accrued to uh, workers who were in minimum wage, uh, in poor families, and no more than about 35% of, uh, of the benefits accrued to all households uh, with incomes up to one and a half times the poverty line. In contrast, a roughly equal amount, 33% of the benefits of the latest minimum wage increase accrued to households with incomes three or more times the poverty level. The minimum wage, in summary, is not an effective policy to help poor families for two reasons. One, most workers in poor families are not affected by the minimum wage. And second, most workers that are affected by the minimum wage are not in poor families. The second point compares the distribution of the benefits of uh, an increase in the minimum wage to $5 an hour compared with the distribution of the benefits of the latest increase in the earned income tax credit that went into effect on January 1 of this year. Now, the uh, most recent proposal for minimum wage increase is to increase the wages from uh, 425 to 515 per hour over two years. This would raise the total cost of the minimum wage package that is uh, evaluated here, but the distribution of the benefits would be much the same. The important point here is the following, is that only 14% of the benefits of increasing the minimum wage would accrue to workers in poor households. Again, even if there is no, no adverse employment effects, and only 27% of the benefits of a minimum wage increase would accrue to workers in households with up to one and a half times the poverty line. Now, for roughly the same cost to the economy of the proposed increase in the minimum wage, 
The earned income tax credit would generate uh, about 35% of the benefits of the earned income tax credit would accrue to workers in poor families. And 66% of the benefits of the earned income tax uh, credit would accrue to families with uh, incomes up to one and a half times the poverty line. So the EITC is a far more effective instrument to increase the incomes of uh, low-income families than the, uh, than the uh, increase in the, in, the, um, in the minimum wage. Now, this EITC increase is already in place as of January 1 of this year. It increases the wages of workers with uh, two children by $1.70 an hour. So it raises their wage from $4.25 an hour to $4 to 5.95 an hour, and that is already in place. Uh, the increases for for workers with less than ch two children is slightly less, and for no children is substantially less. But for workers with children, uh, the EITC increase that is already in place would do a great deal more for uh, workers from poor families than the proposed minimum wage increase, which Congress has yet to vote on. And moreover, the uh, increase in the uh, EITC does not have the adverse uh, employment effects on low-wage workers that is characteristic of the uh, tax minimum wage. I think Professor Burkhauser was correct to uh, conclude this study with the following, with the following words. Aside from nostalgia, it is hard to explain continued support for increasing the minimum wage by those who are genuinely interested in helping the working poor. It is time to relegate the minimum wage to the Museum of Antiquated Policies and to use the EITC as our method of making work pay. My own conclusion is that the minimum wage is maximum folly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Niskanen. I appreciate that. And as, uh, once again, the quote behind me illustrates, as of a year ago, President Clinton agreed with you on that statement. Uh, our final witness in this panel is Professor Edward Montgomery, who is a professor of economics at the University of Maryland. Uh, professor Montgomery, I appreciate you coming today. One of our colleagues had, who had hoped to be here is uh, Bob Ehrlich, one of the freshmen from Maryland, and he asked me to extend you his greeting. Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and testify about the proposed increase in the federal minimum wage. Uh, there are many capable economists who have come to testify on this issue, uh, both at this occasion and previous others. And rather than getting embroiled into what one study shows as opposed to another study shows and, and matching uh, one cut of the data and getting involved in arcane uh, arguments over statistics and methodology, I guess what I would wanted to do was focus on what does the vast body of literature suggest about the likely impacts of the minimum wage. Uh, I think that the overwhelming majority of evidence suggests that the employment losses associated with an increase in minimum wage will be small. Second, changes in earnings inequality over the past decade, many of which have been highlighted, have changed the size and changed the characteristics of the beneficiaries from any change in minimum wage relative to some of our past experience. And finally, while teenagers may account for many of the minimum wage workers, their earnings should not be dismissed as if they are somehow frivolous expenditures. Rather, in many cases, these funds provide household necessities and help finance their investments in college and higher education. As you're aware, well aware, there are, fairly, there are a number of fairly controversial studies looking at this employment effect question. There's been a lot of excitement and debate amongst economists, perhaps not out in the, the rest of the world, but uh, labor economists in particular have become very excited about this, this whole issue. Um, and no doubt, uh, added, I think this debate is added to our reputation as pe people who cannot agree on anything. Uh, we have already heard from economists who are directly involved in those studies. And again, as I said, I don't really want to get involved in them. The question is, are there new lessons that we should draw from the current studies which have not, uh, that we haven't drawn from past studies? The minimum wage is a 60-year-old minimum. Consequently, neither discussions of the pros and cons of increasing the minimum wage or of even having a minimum wage are new. So rather than simply reinvent the wheel, let's examine what the large body of existing work tells us about the impact of this 90 cents uh, increase in the minimum wage. 
While you can use estimates from recent studies to show that the proposed increase in minimum wage will increase employment of low wage and minimum workers, and if you use some of those elasticities, you can get increases of over 10 percent. You can also use recent studies to show that it will reduce employment by a similar amount. I don't believe that the evidence is such that I or the majority of the profession support either of those estimates. While theoretically possible, I do not expect that the proposed increase in minimum wage would actually generate increased employment. However, with few exceptions, the scores and scores of studies, which have been cataloged uh, very aptly by Charlie Brown and others, uh, indicate uh, that job losses or disemployment effects associated with increases in minimum wages tend to be quite small. Professor Welch puts up a graph illustrating, uh, to some degree, the recent experience in the 1980s and 1970s. If one were to conclude that uh, employment was very sensitive to changes in the minimum wage, what would you have expected to see? What you would have expected to see is dramatic improvements in the uh, relative employment of low-wage workers. You would have expected to have seen dramatic improvements in the relative employment of minority workers, who, are, again, are disproportionately uh, uh, low-wage workers. What did you see? What you saw is a relatively modest change uh, that took place over the course of a whole 10-year period, which again suggests that on net, on net, the total effect of a change in the minimum wage, in this case a decrease in the minimum wage, was to generate very small, very small changes in employment in the positive direction. Now you could say that past experience is a poor guide for evaluating current policy and so that the current study should be given more weight. But if you look at these current studies in greater detail and say, do they make us fundamentally need to change our view about the value of past studies, I think the answer still comes down to, no, they don't. One should not simply look, however, at the potential cost of increasing the, the minimum wage. Uh, this may be a particularly grievous oversight given the substantial change in the distribution of earnings, which Professor Murphy and Welch have documented in other of their work. They have shown, they and others have shown, that a decline in the relative position of less educated, less experienced workers has occurred both in terms of their earnings and in their employment prospects. Some economists have noted that the greater rise in inequality in the United States than in Europe can be attributed to the erosion of the minimum wage in the United States. While not necessarily subscribing to the notion that the decline in the minimum wage explains all or even a, a large share of the declining inequality, it is clear that the gap between the top 10 and the bottom 10 percent of adults has widened and much of this is due to lack of gro wage growth for low and median income workers. To the degree low wage workers are secondary workers in a household, then one might be less concerned with their decline in their relative wage. Unfortunately, existing evidence strongly shows that low wage women are married to low wage men, and that families that, and the families that have experienced the most rapid income growth over the past decade are made up of high earning husbands and high earning wives. It is clear that the increase share of households in this country that do not have two earners, and that, but are rather headed by women whose wages tend to be amongst the lowest in the economy. Whether this group accounts for 5, 20, 30, 50 percent, or we can debate all day, but the results are still clear that this group is a significant pool and that it has grown relative to historical case precedent. Let me add one final point on the beneficiaries of minimum wage. Much has been made of the number of teenagers who work at the minimum, whether they are the majority or the minority of minimum wage workers. First, while evidence suggests that 60 percent of those affected by the proposed minimum wage increase are adults, many of the teens do come from low-income households. Again, this is particularly true amongst African-American youth. Their contribution to the economic standing of their family should be not ignored. Second, survey evidence suggests that teens that work, of teens that work, about a third of them are using most or all of their income to finance their education. While the average university tuition is in excess of $10,000, the average student graduates about $18,000 in debt. So it's not surprising that 40% of students at four-year colleges are employed while trying to go to school full-time. And 74% of those who are going to school part-time for higher education are also employed. All of these students are struggling to meet the twin demands of classroom and workforce. The experience of my students at a large state university belies the characterization that their earnings from the min their minimum wage job go to finance frivolous luxuries. An increase in their wage would help ease the burden of financing these needed investments in their human capitals and skill. In summary, let me suggest that the evidence on the minimum wage indicates that changing the minimum wage is not a panacea for all of society's ills. 
Given the magnitude of the proposed increase, it will neither remove uh, all of poverty from our society, nor will it relegate millions of workers to unemployment. The evidence is overwhelming that the job loss associated with this proposed increase will be small. I believe the benefits both in terms of the increased income for 11 million potential beneficiaries uh, who, who support their families and finance their education with this money would be substantial. That this modest increase in the minimum wage can help reduce inequality and enhance fairness should be seen as a benefit. Many of my fellow economists who impose this increase uh, disregard these benefits. They view any disemployment effect associated with an increase in minimum wage as unacceptable. They would and have opposed not only this increase in the minimum wage, but every increase in the minimum wage since it was first instit instituted. In fact, they would tend to oppose the very existence of the minimum wage itself on efficiency grounds. I understand these arguments, and we're all well drilled in them as young economists. Few, if any, government programs or regulation, of course, pass muster under this criterion which maximizes uh, solely the size of the economic pie. Economics, however, is silent on the distribution of the pie or the trade-off between efficiency and equity or fairness. When the evidence is overwhelming uh, and it suggests that the cost of the proposed increase in the minimum wage are small and that it will enhance the well-being of 5 million minimum wage workers or 11 million low-wage low workers, it seems short-sighted to ignore these gains. Consequently, I would urge you to uh, pass the proposed increase in the minimum wage. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Professor Montgomery. Uh, let me now uh, ask actually make one point in the record um, and then ask a question about our alternative. You just mentioned that, that some economists will say on efficiency grounds the correct minimum wage is zero. I, I'll point out the article that I mentioned earlier and have it put in the record that as of a few years ago the New York Times thought that was the case, that the right minimum wage should be zero. And they were essentially arguing, and I quote, there's a virtual consensus among economists that minimum wage is an idea whose time has passed raising the minimum wage by a substantial amount would w hurt working people out of the job market. And ultimately, I think that's our question. Is there a way that we can assist people who are at the low end of a earning scale in this country without having these negative job effects of essentially asking 100,000, as many as 700,000, depending on whose estimates you take, uh, individuals to give up their potential uh, job or their existing job in order to benefit their colleagues in the workforce. And so the proposal that we put together is an alternative that, that essentially, to use Professor Murphy's term, puts it on budget that says this tax transfer uh, will be a restraint by the government from taxing those people who are at the lowest wage level in our society and you have to phase it out so that you don't have a notch there that is, is unacceptable in terms of incentives and allow the employer to pay a hundred percent of their cost in, in, to the employee H have the employers cost go up none or, or some small amount in terms of record keeping and then reduce the government expenditures in other areas in order to make up that difference in the Social Security Trust Fund. And I wanted to ask each of you, and, and I'll start with you, Professor Montgomery, if, what do you think about that as an alternative? Is that a better way to try to help those people? Uh, without having the, all of the details worked out, and I think the devil really is in the details, the, the initial reaction, I think, of most economists uh, to the idea of a wage subsidy, which I think is what I should characterize your proposal, uh, is that that would generate some positive potential employment effects. The evidence on past tax, job tax credits, however, suggests that the effect is very small, uh, if non-existent. A concern that one would need to have is the phase-out issue. What you wouldn't want to generate is a situation where a worker who's right at the, uh, at the a, a penny over uh, the uh, the cap uh, wouldn't want either wouldn't want to raise, or he's right at the cap wouldn't want to raise, or the employer wouldn't want to hire them. So you one needs to be very careful, obviously, with the, the phase-out issues. And obviously, there's there's questions that are associated with how one finances a very slow phase-out as opposed to uh, uh, notches. And we all know from many programs, welfare and other, that having notches generate uh, potentially large disincentive effects. Uh, there are obviously some questions about the IRS's ability to monitor wages. Uh, 
uh, since what they collect is earn income rather than wages, and you want to give the credit for minimum wage, ou wage hours work rather than total income, and so to the degree somebody works overtime, uh, do they get paid for those hours or not? Does the IRS have to set up a separate bureaucracy for that kind of thing? So I think there are some concerns, particularly in the details, about how that kind of proposal would work out, but the broad view approach of some, thinking about some kind of additional tax credit, like the under income tax credit currently does, uh, I, I think most economists are I would support. It, it turns out, as we were drafting the details, to be remarkably easy to, to implement with the current income tax system, where the employer is just given a table and, and they calculate how much of the withholding is paid to the employee and how much is due to the IRS, and, and the amount paid to the employee is, is a credit on the FICA tax towards that person's account. Um, but thank you. Let me, uh, Dr. Niskanen, do you have any comments on that? Chairman McIntosh, I realize, I understand the reasons why you and your colleagues feel compelled to be perceived to be doing something in an election year, but I've learned a long time ago not to pass quick judgment on a complex new proposal. Uh, I see little reason at the moment to rely upon um, uh, an instrument that uh, other than the earned income tax credit. I think it was a mistake for the Republicans to propose uh, limiting the earned income tax credit, and uh, there are problems with that system, mostly in terms of enforcement and the uh, uh, treatment of sources of other income. But I think that's likely to be a much superior to uh, much superior proposal than the than the alternatives, at least in terms of what I have been uh, aware about it uh, so far. But importantly, the EITC is in place, was substantially increased, effective the first of this year, and will generate a great deal more benefits to workers from poor families than the proposed minimum wage increase, which is yet to be voted on. And it uh, does not cost any more to the economy than what the proposed minimum wage increase is. I uh, we'll pass, I, will, uh, I will avoid making judgment about your proposed alternative at the moment, but I, uh, uh, I think that we should not rush to judgment on, uh, on an alternative before we have a full understanding of the policies that are already in place. Uh, I thank you for that caution. I think it's a wise one, although we may be, we may be forced to rush to judgment on voting for a minimum wage. and. And, and I'm told, at least, that at this point there are sufficient votes to put that in in the House and in the Senate on that. Um, Professor Welsh, do you have any comments on the proposal? Uh, I guess uh, the point I'd like to make is that uh, the Social Security system is, is really fouled up. Uh, the way that credits are given, the fact that only 35 years of a work career are counted in computing uh, the average adjusted monthly earnings rather than the, the full career and the full contributions. Uh, the calculation moving from uh, average earns, earnings per week or adjusted earnings per week to uh, the primary insurance amount which governs benefits is phenomenally progressive. Uh, roughly people at the low income or the low leg of the uh, contributed li or credited lifetime earnings uh, will find the value of the Social Security system about nine times as great as people who are always at the Social Security maximum. Uh, with, with that in mind, uh, I don't think if people, and, and one other point, and that is that most people who earn low wages are earning them transitorily. Uh, I would guess many people in this room, uh, at this table and at your table, uh, have worked for the minimum wage or near the minimum wage, and, and if you haven't, your children probably have or will. Uh, and the idea that those people need some kind of assistance, I think, is, is, is just wrong. Uh, the idea of, of removing this tax burden, and it is Social Security, I mean, that's almost all of it, uh, is an attractive one. I just don't see the need to credit the Social Security contribution and fund it in some other way. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Murphy. 
Uh, yeah, a um, couple things that uh, I would like to add. First, I think to characterize the minimum wage in a discussion of, say, the EITC or the kind of proposal that you're talking about is, is really a mischaracterization. The proposal you're talking about sounds like, and the EIT certainly is, an effective way of fighting poverty and redistributing income to low low income households. By comparison, I mean the minimum wage is not in the same league. I mean the minimum wage as a redistribution tool is so blunt and so ineffective that I, I don't know how one could make such comparison. As I said before, there's a you know if, if that's our criterion that we need something to be redistributive, there's there's a million policies that would be in line ahead of the minimum wage. So if it really is some kind of trade-off between efficiency and just pure redistribution for the sake of redistribution, the minimum wage wouldn't even be considered. So it's clearly a political motive there. The policy that you're talking about, I think, in principle, sounds like it's moving in the right direction. Although I think that it might be better to go ahead and think of paying it or implementing that policy through a type of tax credit where you got a tax credit based on what was paid in. So effectively you are eliminating the Social Security tax. That would probably allow for a more effective means of limiting the range and the scope of individuals who might be eligible for such, an, for such a credit. So I, I think it's a good idea. And I, I think the main thing is we have to get away from the, the problem with the minimum wage which is what you're talking about is not giving the credit across the board to the people in the high income households as well as the people in the low income households. You're really trying to think of a way to target it at, at the low income households. And uh, I think that would be effective. So I think that type of a program, again, you know, as everybody said, the devil is in the details. But that's certainly a much better starting point than starting with something as arbitrary as the current uh, minimum wage proposal which would do, frankly, very little to uh, fight poverty. And all these other proposals have positive effects. People might argue they're small, but there's certainly going to be positive effects on employment as opposed to the negative ones inherent in the minimum wage. So I, I would see those types of things as a great starting point. Hopefully, we could have something that, like that that we would work on as an alternative and not rush to judgment, but have that as a backdrop that we know we can turn to if, if we're fortunate enough to be able to avoid the, the current proposal. Thank you, Mr. Mur Professor Murphy. I appreciate that. Um, let me now turn to my colleagues, and we'll turn to our colleague from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me first begin by saying uh, I want to thank this panel for appearing. Uh, I think as the other panels, they have added to the dialogue here. I simply want to start by noting, as I did before, that I thought the last panel was particularly helpful uh, in trying to simply educate the American people on the uh, issues involved in the minimum wage and try to go at this issue of 70 or 80 percent of Americans believe we ought to increase the minimum wage. And I think it is uh, vitally important that more and more people hear that message. And I think this panel has done a great job at a kind of an intellectual level. I think the last panel did a superb job at a kind of a gut level of explaining the problem with that. I would note, just for the record, Mr. Chairman, to make a request. Since Congressman Condit, Congressman Waxman, Congresswoman, uh, Congressman Kanjorski, Congressman Spratt did not apparently have the time to come to this hearing or hear any of the testimony, either the eloquent testimony of the last panel or the intellectual testimony of this panel, and our freshman colleague, Congresswoman Meek, also didn't have the time. I would hope that as a committee we could provide them either with a videotape uh, or urge to present to them perhaps uh, the time schedule at which time C-SPAN might replay this because I think this is vitally important information on a critical issue. I would also urge that since Congressman Peterson and Congresswoman Slaughter will only be able to stay with us briefly. Uh, essentially, no member of the majority, minority has been here today. Perhaps we could also provide them with a videotape or a schedule. And I would like to see us provide the President and uh, Secretary Reich with that same videotape because I think this has been invaluable testimony. Having said that, I want to turn uh, and thank Mr. Montgomery for his testimony. I, I happen to note, Mr. Montgomery, I, I ultimately lost count, but I believe either three or four or five times in your testimony, you indicated that the job loss would be small. Um, I, I presume that for those who are currently employed at the minimum wage and who would lose their jobs and who reside in the districts of those members who couldn't come here today or chose not to, 
and for those who are just outside the economic ladder, that is, they don't have a minimum wage job, but their application is sitting at McDonald's or Burger King trying to get that first wage, uh, that first job, reach that first rung of the economic ladder, I think uh, there again it would be very helpful for those constituents who probably wish that their member of Congress on this committee had been here to hear this testimony today, uh, had, uh, it would be useful for them to have this testimony. Having said that, uh, let me start, uh, Mr. Murphy, with a quick question to you. You said this is really a tax transfer scheme. Can you just put that in briefly in simple English by what you mean, what this Congress is really doing? Yeah, I mean, really, we've had a lot of discussion today focusing on two things. One is the gains that would go to the minimum worker, wage workers who keep their jobs and get 515 rather than 425, and the cost, which is the people who lose their jobs. But we completely ignored the other part of the cost, which is a big component of the cost, which is the higher prices or reduced profits to the employers, or most of it's going to show up in higher prices, paid for by the consumers. And that's really the biggest element of the tax. And so what we're not talking about is income gains for some offset by some economic loss through reduced employment. What we're really talking about is taking money from these people over here giving them to these people over here, and in the process, reducing employment as a third element. And what happens when you look at who pays the cost of the higher minimum in terms of the types of jobs, you look where they are. They're in the food service. They're in eating. They're in child care. They're in health care, nursing homes, social services. I mean, that's not Bill Gates, right? They're, we're talking about taking the money out. The tax is being paid for by the consumers of those products. And importantly, it's like, like I said, it's so simple. You just go into a McDonald's and look at the guys in front of the counter and behind the counter, and the people that aren't here today, in their infinite wisdom, are saying they know enough to say that we should take money from the guys in front of the counter and give it to the guys behind the counter. Frankly, when I look at the picture, it, it makes no sense. I don't see it. That's my point, that redistribution is not the name of the game with the minimum wage. It is redistribution, but kind of a very arbitrary sort. It's not helping the poor. It's taking from the guys buying the hamburgers to give it to the guys making the hamburgers. And I don't see that. Um, Mr. Niskanen, um, Mr. Welsh, Mr. Murphy, let me ask you. My impression is, and I'm not an economist, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even a numbers person, that our economy is currently growing at a rather anemic 2%. Uh, that at times in the past this economy has grown at 4 to 5 percent, that in fact the economy in Chile uh, is growing at 7 to 7.5 percent. Uh, do you have a reason to believe that this arbitrary government dictated price setting, that is us increasing the minimum wage, will help or hurt the economic growth of this economy, which is, you know, charging along at 2 percent right now? Is that a softball? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it can't help. I think there may be reason to argue about how much it hurts, but it clearly can't help. The idea somehow that uh, the economy is growing uh, at a slow rate because of the minimum wage is not adequate, I think it's just beyond uh, comprehension. Mr. Murphy? Yeah, I have a couple things to add. I mean, it was, it, Professor Montgomery brought up earlier the notion that there have been a big expansions in the return to schooling and experience deferentials, the returns to accumulating skills and what we in the profession would call human capital, that is uh, skills and education and things possessed by the workers, that the gain to increasing those is greater than ever. And when you see such an increase in returns, there are really two types of policies the government could possibly adopt. One would be to try to foster investment and take advantage of those skills and take advantage of those returns, saying, look, the premium for increasing our skills of our workforce and therefore growing the economy as a whole is greater today than probably any time in the last 50 years. So a policy that tried to encourage investment, and that would be encouraging people to go to school, that would be encouraging the people who are not in school to be able to get jobs and accumulate those skills on the job the most effective place for many of those people. The alternative of trying to counteract this by somehow compressing back, pushing the world back to where it was, is in fact not only not going to allow us to take advantage of the tremendous returns on investment today, but actually slow down the growth of the economy. And I think that holds for the minimum wage and a whole range of policy choices. I would rather like to see us address 
the higher differences in incomes and the greater returns to skills and human capital by facilitating investment in those skills rather than trying to artificially compress the differentials and thereby really discourage the very investment that would be the saving grace of our economy in this case. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could just conclude with one quick question. Uh, Mr. Welsh, I noticed that Mr. Montgomery seemed to minimize the effect of your charts and he said, well, if the economy was really uh, very sensitive to an increase in the minimum wage, we would have seen much more dramatic uh, effects. I personally thought the effects shown by your charts were rather dramatic, but I thought you ought to be afforded an opportunity to respond. Uh, well, I just wondered uh, if we had looked at the same picture. Uh, what, what is true uh, is that following the increase, the 91 increase, uh, we have not seen the rebound, the rebound in teenage employment that you suspect that you might have seen holding the nominal minimum wage, minimum wage constant. Uh, part of that, of course, was a prolong prolonged recession, but the recession is over. Uh, part of it is the fact that uh, Mr. Montgomery was talking about, and that is that at the lower parts of the wage distribution, productivity has been falling, wages have been falling. That's the kind of inequality that Kevin's talking about. And the real bite of the minimum wage has hung up there. Uh, it's, it's continued to stay expensive. If, uh, if one goes back and says, let's take the period just prior to minimum wage increases and hypothetically go through the data and increase the minimum wage without any employment effect and say, how much did we raise the cost of teenage labor, say? Uh, if we go to the 1990 increase, uh, we bumped the minimum wage about 15 percentage points but we raised the cost of employing teenagers by a tad under 2 percent. That's all. Because most people are earning above the minimum wage anyway, uh, and many or the majority are earning above the new minimum where it's going. Uh, again, in 91, we raised another 2 percent, cumulatively a tad under 4 percent. Uh, if we make the increase that's on the table now, uh, it looks like we're going to raise it 7 or 8 percent. So in nominal terms, the same 90 cents is going to have a bite into the wage distribution that's twice as big as what we were looking at before. You saw the employment effects before. Uh, <laughs> numbers don't lie, and you know, liars may work with numbers, and you know, you know about statistics. But uh, for my money, that was a dramatic effect, and I think you're talking about something much more serious right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shattuck. Uh, let me say, as to your idea on procuring a tape, we'll work with C-SPAN to see if we might be able to do that, and I think your suggestions on who they should be distributed to would be good. I suspect that Mr. Peterson, who did want to be here today, but unfortunately had a conflict with another hearing, uh, would also appreciate the ability for us to make the, all of the testimony today as widely available as possible, because I think it's very compelling, and I thank you for that suggestion. Let me turn now to our colleague from Minnesota, Mr. Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Welch, you started your uh, <clears throat> remarks this morning essentially saying relative to what? And I think that's a, an interesting con concept, and I've been thinking about that. <clears throat> and, and in fact, I, maybe first I want to question Professor Montgomery, because while you favor raising the, the minimum wage, w would you argue that if we raise the minimum wage to, say, $100 an hour, that it, there, at some point there is a consequence to this decision? And if I understand your testimony, you're saying that a 45 cent an hour or 50 cent an hour raise per year over the next two years uh, really would have a, a smaller consequence than some of the other professors have, have stated. Is that essentially what you're telling us? You would agree that if you raise it to $100 an hour, it would have a dramatic consequence. Uh, absolutely. I, I don't think that uh, one could constitute uh, that magnitude of an increase and not expect to have dramatic changes in employment. Uh, the point uh, uh, that I wanted to summarize was simply that the effect that we're talking about, this is a relatively modest change in the minimum wage, uh, and that uh, although Professor Welch's graph showed us that supply curves do slope upwards, the question is, is how sensitive is that curve? And the evidence suggests that it is relatively insensitive so that you would have a small effect associated with a change, this size change in the minimum wage. But clearly, if you were contemplating 
20, 30, 20 dollars an hour minimum wage, you would expect a much bigger. But, but it seems to me the issue before the Congress now is, and, and, if, and I would also maybe say to the, uh, to the other professors, uh, would any of you advocate zero minimum wage? I mean, uh, the New York, New York Times editorial, okay, one, two, three. So you'd, you'd say no minimum wage at all? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't recall the name of the gentleman who was on the right-hand side in the last panel. M Mr. Yukta. But he had it exactly right. I mean, it's not that people are going to be paid zero. That's crazy. I mean, people have a right to protect their own interest, and they're knowledgeable. I mean, when, when people are uninformed, there may be some excuse for intervention. But otherwise, people protect their own interest. And one thing, one of the hardest economic lessons to learn, apparently, for tamperers uh, is that one man's meat is not necessarily another man's poison. And it can be mutually beneficial to work out a deal that's going to allow for wage progression along with productivity accumulation. And you see it again and again. And you do not have to sort of put in these arbitrary floors that only impede opportunities for the accumulation of skill. Yeah, I, I think the evidence is very clear that if, if you reduce the minimum wage, even if you reduced it to zero, that's not going to mean that it's, you know, people have this false conception that somehow that means all these minimum wage workers are going to go to zero. In fact, that's so far from the case that, you know, it's, it's, it's really ludicrous that, in fact, as we saw the minimum drift down over the 1980s in real terms, as it was not increased, it stayed constant in nominal terms. Wage growth and inflation, of course, eroded the real minimum. The fraction of people at the minimum went down steadily. Most of the people held their ground with wages. Wages did, were allowed to fall, and more people were able to get employment at those somewhat lower wages. And so we're not talking about pulling the rug out from under people. We're really talking about opening up opportunity for a great deal more individuals. So there'd be some reductions in wages, but you know, once you reduced it 20 or 30 percent from the current level, you really there wouldn't be much beyond that that would matter at all. This is a form of price controls, and it has many of the same effects as price controls of queuing, a deterioration in quality, and so forth. The queuing in this case takes place in the form of increased number of people who want the minimum wage jobs but can't get it, and the deterioration in quality will be the deterioration of the non-wage dimensions of the labor relationship. Uh, at, at most economists have come to recognize that price controls are foolish. Uh, I'm just really surprised to find that there are still economists who believe that price controls in this particular area uh, have any merit whatsoever. And this particular one has no merits on the basis of uh, a redistribution program because it is particularly ineffective in redistributing income to workers from poor families. A very large portion of the benefits accrue to uh, people in families with incomes of three times or more of the poverty line. And so I don't see it has, it has no merits whatsoever as a means of increasing the efficiency of the economy. And I think it has extraordinarily uh, poor uh, uh, qualifications for redistributing income uh, if the purpose is to redistribute it toward the poor. I, I'm wondering, uh, I, I do want to get back to another point that's been raised earlier. We've had some discussion when, we, when NAFTA was passed and so forth that American labor couldn't compete with 17 cent an hour labor in other parts of the, of the world. Uh, what are the consequences? Have you done any studies? Uh, would any of you care to comment on what the uh, the ability of America to, America to compete in the world marketplace, what happens when we artificially set wages? Our most formidable competitors are not countries like Bangladesh, but are countries like Japan. And so the wage rates themselves are the very small part of that issue. It is, it is labor costs per unit of output, and it's comparative. Uh, the productivity of these countries is, uh, is, is the key reason why Bangladesh can't compete and why J Japan can with wages that are comparable, if not higher, than uh, those in the United States. Now, I think that it's plausible, although the numbers are not yet in, that the expansion of uh, trade has contributed to the wider spread of the wage distribution. 
Uh, there is a big argument among economists on that issue, and I think that uh, at least the uh, hypothesis is plausible. I do not find it plausible that the increased spread in the wage distribution is a consequence of the uh, erosion of the male, real minimum wage. There, there is an argument that uh, a minimum wage could help U.S. labor. Uh, that, of course, would involve imposing the minimum in other countries. And uh, if you could just do that, uh, it, it might work. If, if the gentleman would yield for a second, isn't that the point that, that we cannot legislate a minimum wage for Japan, China, Mexico, any other country, and, and that in a relatively free market economy, uh, the inability to impose that type of regulation elsewhere puts us at a real disadvantage? That's pretty much the argument. There's, uh, we also haven't been able to devise a minimum wage for self-employed. And I, I've argued elsewhere that uh, a real high minimum uh, would go a long way toward preserving the family farm that might help in Minnesota. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I might just say, though, I, I think in some respects the, the argument is, is even bigger than that. Because while I'm not an economist, I am an auctioneer. And I do understand the ultimate law of the economic universe. And it's called the law of supply and demand. And we've tried a lot of things, but it, we've never been able to repeal that. And uh, ultimately, uh, markets are probably more powerful than any mandates that we pass here in this Congress anyway. I mean, markets will prevail. They even prevailed in the former Soviet Union. Uh, I, I do want, if I could have one last question, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'd like to get a comment from uh, Professor Montgomery. And I do appreciate him coming here today and, and his testimony. But I, I assume that you heard Mr. Yukta and, and talked a little bit about Washington, D.C., because maybe that's a good example. Maybe it's not, where we have artificially set wage levels even higher than the, the national minimum wage. And at least to a layman who looks at, at Washington, D.C. and all the problems we have, uh, at least in some respects, you can argue that uh, teenage unemployment is even higher in Washington, D.C. than it certainly is in the surrounding suburbs or, or other metropolitan areas. Would you care to comment on that, or is that just an anomaly, or are there are a lot of other factors, or any advice, comment, suggestions? D did you hear Mr. Yukta's testimony? I, I, I caught the tail end of his testimony, so I'm sorry if I mi end up mischaracterizing his argument. Uh, I, I guess the response to that it would simply be, uh, as with your other question, that if you have too high a minimum wage, uh, that employers and uh, will either reduce uh, their employment of workers or try and move elsewhere to try and avoid that uh, to the degree uh, that that w that might very well exist. Uh, whether that is the explanation for the relative high unemployment rates uh, of youth in, in Washington, D.C., I, I have some problems with that. One, because amongst adults or non-minimum wage workers, it is also the case that the unemployment rates in Washington, D.C. are appreciably higher than they are in the surrounding suburbs of Virginia and Maryland. So something else is going on besides any impact of the minimum wage, which is also contributing here. And whether the minimum wage is a, is a part of that picture, I can't say, but not having studied that conclusively. It it could be a part of the picture, but my, uh, my guess is that it is a small part at best uh, or worse of, of that picture. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gutnick, and thank you, members of the panel, for joining us today. Uh, your complete testimony and charts will all be made part of the record. Let me close this hearing by, by saying that I hope that this Congress can rise above politics in making this decision. I think the opponents and the proponents of a minimum wage increase all want the same thing, which is to raise the standard of living and for those who are perhaps at the lowest rungs of our economic ladder. Uh, but as President Clinton said, and I come back to this again, it's the wrong way to increase incomes of low-wage earners. And what we heard of from today were real people who will be hurt by that. Uh, we heard from Don Baish, who uh, used to be on welfare, is now, he tells me after the hearing, taking care of his little daughter, Maya, on his own, earning a job, living, working at a job, because he was able to start out at minimum wage. Uh, we heard from Mr. Helgeth and that the disabled workers will be disadvantaged if we make this increase. Uh, we heard from Professor Newmark that blacks and Hispanics are disproportionately harmed among the population, whether it be small or large, who are disadvantaged if we raise the minimum wage. Uh, we know from the testimony that the elderly are disadvantaged and that Mr. Ukta's kids 
here, minority kids who are in the juvenile system, who want to start their own business and start to have the American dream, will be disadvantaged because he won't be able to help them out. He won't be able to be their guardian angel. So there are real people who are harmed when we do the wrong thing here in Congress. But what I'm hoping we can do is rise above it and do the right thing. Find a way to truly help people increase their take-home pay so that we don't punish those who are disadvantaged. I think it may take a trade-off by reducing somewhat our welfare payments, which end up being about $9 an hour in Indiana, and reducing the taxes on people who are earning income at the lowest brackets. The exact way to do that, as people have said, the devil will be in the details. There's got to be, though, a better way than a regulation that punishes some people in a well-intended effort to make others better off. And I continue to strive to work towards that. This committee will stay in recess until Thursday when we have a second hearing on this issue on the cost of government. In that second hearing, we will be looking at the cost of regulation and litigation and why that takes away from the ability of small businesses to be able to increase pay for their workers. Thank you all for coming. The committee will stand adjourned. House plans to take up minimum wage legislation sometime next week. Our 1996 Congressional Directory helps you follow proceedings in the House and Senate and at committee hearings. It includes members' biographies, committee assignments, and information about C-SPAN programs.